Yo, so we're here. It's a Monday. And you know what? Mondays after showcases, if someone if one of us did well, it's a fun time. However, uh personally, I've just had a mental block or whatever you want to call it, or you know, whatever, and been basically doing horribly in every tournament, but that's okay. Eventually it will either I'll stop playing every tournament, which will even itself out, or I'll start doing well again. One one of the two will happen. I don't think there's any room for anything. But yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I would like to try and be comforting and say that, oh, well, we all go through bad patches occasionally. But then you see these kids like Milan and Nathan and Sam, uh, Rolf and mm -hmm. so on, just like literally crushing every tournament they play. And it's easy to kind of <laughs> get demoralized there. Well, I, you know, compare yourself against that impossible standard. No, 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 no. I'm never going to do that because I know when you're a kid, you just have nothing yeah. better to think about. Honestly, like... This is the thing you care about all the time. This is what you spend all of your energy on. So to see them crush repeatedly because their efforts are good, it's awesome, honestly. Um, I don't think I can ever do that nowadays because I'm just too old. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds crazy. It sounds like you No, might have... I mean, you're just uh, making me confront my own mortality here. Well... I've had a few experiences with that lately, but I'm not gonna yeah. I'm not gonna dwell on that too much because that's not what this stream is about. Let me see if I can fix the size of these. This stream is about me. Woo! It is for today. All right. So Dom, I recall you saying last week that this format was heinous. Yeah, uh, trash and... format, terrible gameplay. So on and so <laughs> okay, on. I guess you still believe that, but you know, a tournament's still a tournament. There, there's edge to be gained. The Mostly in deck building, I think, in this format. And you know, uh, what do you? Do? Yeah, <laughs> tell me about this deck and uh, why you picked it. Well, uh, playing the format because there's a showcase and I have a bunch of QPs that are about to expire because they all go away on uh, Thursday um, or Friday, whenever it is. And so mm -hmm. this tournament was basically a free roll. If it took any other form of payment, whether it's ticks or paypals <laughs> or whatever, would not have entered, would not right. even have considered entering. Um, yep. But instead, you know, I, I was here, I was awake, so I decided to enter the tournament, and so I built a deck, and here is my deck. Wow, uh, that wasn't really as in depth I was hoping for. Well, let's let's talk about some specifics rather than uh, that generalization. Obviously, in vintage, the sort of how should I put it? The blue decks tend to be a lot more homogenized. Uh, well, all of the restricted cards are generally played, with the exception of Time Twister, which is in or out. But that's the most notable part of this list, in my opinion, which is how many Hole Breachers are playing? Not one, not two, not three, but four Hole Breachers, which is, uh, I would call it a metric ton in British terms. Yeah, I, so the idea there was, it seemed like the format was kind of in a place where you have a lot of big blue, so stuff like PO, uh, and then the other blue like combo control decks so stuff like doomsday always a perennial vintage deck uh, and some other stuff and then the other major axis was uh bizarre decks and specifically it seemed like non-dredge versions of bizarre so stuff like squee and hogak hollow vine stuff like that where um whole breacher is because of the interaction between bizarre and dredge where uh so let, let's say i have bizarre you have whole breacher if I'm a dredge deck, I can activate my bazaar on my upkeep, assuming I haven't dredged at the turn yet. I can replace the first draw with a dredge, and then the second draw and subsequent draws, for the sake of whole breacher purposes, it acts as if those cards were not drawn because you've replaced the draw, right? And so the second draw goes ahead and, and so on. Um, and so you can kind of circumvent uh, a whole breacher that way uh, if you're the dredge deck. If you are some other form of bazaar, though, Whole Breacher just kind of shuts you down. You almost have a a turn or maybe two to actually do something. And then beyond that, you know, the, the card that powers your deck doesn't really function anymore. Um, so it seemed like against those two pillars of uh, various blue decks and Bizarre, you know, Whole Breacher was a great card. And in general, one of the big narratives coming into the weekend was Pyroblast had kind of disappeared from the format. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't see much like Underworld Breach anymore. Uh, there's no Jeskai in part because of uh, Bug being popular and uh, Bizarre being popular again. And so it seemed like uh, Flusterstorm had kind of taken the place that Bizarre, uh, that uh, Pyroblast had, excuse me, in the format a few months ago, where if your crucial threat or your crucial answer was weak to that card, 
then you really could not rely on that resolving against those decks. Whereas if um, your threat uh, dodged that card, then it was actually going to be surprisingly hard for them to deal with sometimes. And so against that backdrop, you know, in a Flusterstorm format rather than a Hole Breacher format, stuff like a uh, Hole Breacher looks very good, stuff like uh, the, the Time Vault combo uh, look, looks very good. Um, just a bunch of these cards, which, uh, you know, their value may wax and wane depending on what's going on. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it seemed like they would be well positioned for the weekend. And then the other big thing was Urza Saga. So this is yep. uh, obviously... It jumps out at you as a card which, well, this this is going to be amazing in vintage, right? You have all <laughs> right. the Markson, Sol Ring, Black Lotus. Uh, you have this combo that's worked its way in where with Time Belt and Urza Saga, the, the, uh, the Saga can find a Manifold key which can uh, untap the Time Belt uh, over and over again. Um, and so the question is, how good is that card, actually? And I know Justin, who is in the chat, was just not optimistic about saga at all could not make it work in basically any shell but i knew just for my own personal preference right like i i'm not an experienced vintage deck builder mm -hmm. or whatever but i just wanted to play saga it seemed like it would be a really sweet card to play with and um a fun card in the format and i think it actually is very good but because of how weak it is to not just wasteland which is in a lot of the the top decks but mm -hmm. also uh force of vigor and then also, you know, your artifact mana getting attacked by collector roof and things. I think you basically have to treat it like it's a spell that just happens to be a land right. versus uh, versus a land. And so that's why you see this deck has 17 lands technically and all the artifact mana, which is a very high count for a deck. And that's because I'm effectively treating the sagas mostly as spells uh, rather than as lands. Yeah, it's uh, 25 mana sources if you count Sol Ring as well. It's sort of... I don't know if this is a proper way to uh, phrase it. This feels like the Urza sort of weirdo tempo -y Urza decks you like to play in modern in a weird sort of way, where you sort of sit around drawing cards, then eventually you assemble some combo kill. So I kind of feel like that's a weird analog that sort of happens to be a purpose for this. Well, the, uh, the card Urza actually did decently well in Vintage uh, yeah. this weekend. There was a... <laughs> a blue-white kind of a controlling blue deck, which I think three people finished in the top 16 with, two of them oh, yeah. losing their win into the top eight. So that, that top eight could have been very different, and the narrative coming out of the tournament could have been very different. And so that deck uh, had, a, had a lot of the, the similar cards there. Um, I think in retrospect, and I, you know, had I played a game before the tournament or if I played games of vintage in general, uh, <laughs> I think would have realized that the... Uh, the the days i'm doing side of things here was actually just not really necessary like mm -hmm. if you're playing this deck it's not because you're going for this one two punch with whole breacher mm -hmm. into time twister or into days i'm doing it's because you think whole breacher is just a good card and then you know the one copy of time twister in your deck is like a good shooter target for when you have all of that going on right so really you don't need two of that type of effect when it's already covered by one. Plus you're you're actually you have five of that type of effect where you want to think of Narset as the fifth hole breacher, which I think is actually more accurate to do so in this sort of list. So Days and Doing kind of not a very good card, I think generally speaking is how you would put it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um and I, I guess the other question that naturally suggests itself is why this versus PO and PO mostly is a deck that I've played in the past when I've dabbled uh, in Vintage. I actually had another like free roll showcase a while back where I started out 5-0 and oh, and then started to get my hopes up and then the wheels just completely fell off and missed top 8. Um, so I was glad to not see that happen again this time. But what I found in you know watching a lot of people stream PO and so on was that it felt like the PO side of the deck was actually not that good or that necessary. And it was the other like big blue shell that was carrying the day like tinker uh mental and a lot of lists uh some of the the backup plans like the time vault stuff or the the whole breach stuff and so on um and so for example i you know justin and kane and some others were streaming a, a po deck with dress down during the week and that seemed kind of genius to me yep. so dress down is uh, this mh2 card that uh, when it comes in you draw a card it removes abilities from creatures and then it sacrifices itself at the end of turn and so this is a great way to disable collector oof or lavinia leovold hole breacher stuff like that uh for a turn and that one turn often is all you need to to go off with your po and win the game and what often seemed like was happening was all right well the dress downs are really good but the po stuff is just whatever um 
and that that theme came out time and time again and so i wanted a a big blue deck that kept a lot of the the good stuff about those shells but didn't have to play either po itself or some of the stuff that po makes you play like mox opal for example where that card is you know so high variance and such a clunker in a lot of your draws um i wanted to just you know trim the fat there and the way that I went about it was I added more fat in its place. You know, I have a day's undoing that I don't need. Uh, yeah. You know, I have a lot of this stuff here. Um, so, you know, I de definitely a lot of improvements that we made to this deck, but that's how I arrived at this uh, basic concept. Yeah. So the, there's a few things on back there. Um, Versus Saga being soft of Force of Vigor, I think it is like kind of awkward, but it's not necessarily a deal breaker. And the, the real issue, I think, Saga within like, say, the bug matchup is that. You don't actually want to be down a land after a few turns in that matchup because of how they try to attack you, which is like wasteland all of your color sources, play an oof, play a Leovold. Like, I kind of view Bug as a hate bears deck that happens to have like blue cards in it more than anything else, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I only played one match against Bug in the tournament, and this uh -huh. was a eventual winner, uh, Matthew Vuk. Um, uh -huh. But w what I found was that, you know, Saga's weakness to, to wasteland or force, it was manageable as long as you had the room to play around it whereas right. if you know this is a mana source that you're relying on to cast your spells then it's easier to get blown out by you know a force getting saga and something else or the wasteland just completely locking you out of the game yeah and there's actually one really interesting thing about this list i just noticed which is you don't play any of the really big card dollars say dig through time or treasure cruise even though it's kind of interesting you literally have nothing else that interacts with your graveyard i believe so it's kind of interesting and also kind of weird, I think, for Vintage, right? Yeah, I, I I wasn't a big fan of the, specifically the card draw spells in a format that has a lot of hole breaches at the moment. So stuff like okay. Treasure Cruise or Gush. Uh, you know, Gush does conflict with Saga and Academy and so on. So that one is, is easier to see why it's not there. But um, definitely could be in the market for some kind of slightly bigger draw spell, like a... I haven't been a fan of like Night's Whisper in the past, but maybe something like that. Or, you know, the, the one dig actually, I think could be good um, just because that can find, you know, the vault and the key or it can find mentor and backup or the tinker and backup and so on. Um, so specifically the first dig through time, I, mean, yeah. I guess you can only play one, but you see what I'm saying here. Um, the, the one dig I think is probably a good inclusion. I would find room for that. But um, also I think that those cards increase your exposure to like so let's say you dig through time as an example right in theory that card doesn't get shut down by uh leovold or hole breacher but if your hand is full of like preordains or whatever and ponders yeah, yeah. that you can't cast because of those cards then filling your graveyard to the point where you can cast a dig actually is easier said than done so um i, I wanted cards that mostly just stood on their own and uh just, yeah i think some some more card filtering could be good there like i don't know if you need the second top or maybe it's more preordains maybe it's the dig whatever um but yeah i think that's uh that, that explains that angle it, my suspicion is i would probably cut the days in doing for a third preordain and i also look at turning echoing truth into hercules recall or dress down i'm not sure which and i would probably try to shove dig through time in there as a one of personally based on how you're constructed yeah. I kind of don't love main decking plow. The the reason you see like, you know, the red builds play bolt, because sometimes it kills like a Narset or something. I don't really love playing a removal spell on my main deck. Maybe you just have to, how the format is, but um uh, that that's just a small note. Maybe it's correct, yeah, I, maybe it's not. That, that was a nod to uh bug and bizarre, where mm -hmm. you know, against bug is you know, the best removal spot that you can have, and I think a good reason to be in white. Um, mm -hmm. And then again, bizarre decks of any stripe, you know, I have four needles in my 75, so yep. often I'm going to be able to shut them down after the first bizarre turn, but if that first bizarre turn involves, you know, at least one hollow one, then uh, that can often win the game by itself. And uh, so I wanted to just have that one thing to have access to. And people do sh show up with random nonsense like Archon of Amiria sometimes or, you know, God knows what. So it, it seemed like having the the one plan in the deck was fairly low cost, but had a pretty high upside. Yeah. And also Hole Breacher as well, you know, if, if I expect a lot of the mirror. Um, one other big target that I should have had in my own deck was Lavinia, which I... Yeah. 
I, I yeah. found myself playing some of these like pseudo mirrors or against these PO yep. decks, and it's like, well, if they have Lavinia here, I am just going to be completely blown under the water. Luckily, they never did, but it's like, oh, well, my games for my end would also be a lot easier if I had <laughs> Lavinia. So um, that that's another important sort of target, yep. and I would definitely want, you know, at least two of my 75, probably both of those in the main deck. I, you know, that card would have been fantastic in so many spots. And again, if you care about Bizarre, you know, this this is one of the best cards against Bizarre decks. Well, so well, let me unpack a few things. A, I do think Lavinia is quite good, which is why I think White Blue PO in the hands of Brian Cook did make top eight as well. I'm not sure it's so much the PO shell like we talked. I think maybe Saga plus Lavinia is a coherent plan versus Force of Vigor. Same for Teferi 3. All those things might add up to your sagas being safer for that sort of stuff. Uh, you don't play Teferi 3 because I think you're more focused on try, trying to do the whole creature thing instead, which also makes sense. I think it's just pick what three drops you want to play, and they're probably going to be good in Vintage because you can accelerate them out faster, and they're probably going to do something you know, remotely unfair in some sort of manner of speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I watched Brian's uh, video earlier today, and mm -hmm. to, to me, one of the the main cases for the PO package is you're meant to be better against Bizarre decks, right? And yeah, he just got 3 very easily by Dredge. Um, so, you know, if if it's not salvaging you there, I think this kind of approach is probably better across the board, or that you know blue eye control style um, angle that people went for. Uh, so I think the basic shell here is pretty good, but definitely a lot of, uh, improvements to be made by people who actually play vintage, which is, uh, maybe me in the future. I don't know. Maybe it's actually well, a good format now that I, uh, top eight the tournament. It, it, it's definitely you one more time in about two weeks, whether or not you'll actually enjoy it. That's your own prerogative or whatever, however you want to put it. Um, a few notes. I really love having both robots in the sideboard, the big robots. And I, I've been pro this. You saw me ranting about that in one of the discords, I think, a lot. How I think it's just correct to play both. And some people main deck the Sphinx. I'm not a huge fan of that because I kind of think, like, you don't need to do that unless if you expect, you know, Bug plus Bizarre to be greater than 60% of the field, which I probably wouldn't. Uh, but yeah, I love having both big robots and... Honestly, the rest of the sideboard is sort of self-explanatory, I think. Yeah, I uh, I just kind of took it on on faith that the the, the two robots uh, were good, and so you know, just put my trust in you and others there. And uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I think I I don't think I ever actually tutored for the Sphinx. Obviously, would have if I had the option against uh, Bug, but um, yeah, I think that's a fine use of those slots. Yeah, it's just like, I mean. The problem with relying on one for both of the matchups is a Blight Steel is horrible for Spock because of this Oko Thief of Crowns cards. Let's not rant about that one that much. But Sphinx of the Steel one on the other hand, well, you don't care about Noko because you're just gonna like kill their Oko, then kill them with cards. So kind of nice to have both and obviously Blight Steel plus Hercules is like almost always lethal for shops. I can't really fathom spots where it's not. Would be have to be like very specific and probably involving like you know activating uh i don't know i i really can't think of something probably metamorph is involved in those scenarios where you it's not lethal but then hercules recall still take care of that mm -hmm. all right uh so is there anything else oh i want to ask all right few achievement asks how many times do you assemble vault key uh, quite a few times, actually. Uh, huh. I would say probably four, I think, over the course of the tournament. Um, th right. That package really impressed me a lot, actually. Okay. How many times did you activate top in response, untap your top, and draw a card? I don't think I got to do that one, unfortunately. Okay. I, I was hoping for the the stretch goal of uh, activate both my tops and then echoing truth them in response, but uh, that didn't come up either. Yeah, I think that echoing truth is probably nonsense, honestly. But, yes. you know, do, yeah. do whatever you want. Uh, how many times did you unbockable a lethal construct? There was one spot where I think I should have set up for that, but I didn't. And other than that, it didn't come up. All right, cool. Uh, oh no, the real, the real one is unbockable your blight steel, right? That's, that's sick. That's probably, a nice one. Yeah. yeah or, probably, uh, probably didn't come up. I'm, I'm basically just looking for the obscure ones because like tinkering for Citadel, killing your opponent, it's so pedestrian. Like... That just happens if you do that. That's not... Well, one thing that's not even really an achievement anymore is uh, hardcasting Citadel off Lotus, oh. because with Saga, 
that yeah. just that just happens on turn three. Like that that's a thing you can actually pay towards now. Yeah, the the Citadel being in your hand, yeah, it's awkward, but if the saga is just in your opener and you have two other lands, it's just well, okay, it's a little bit awkward. What I actually need to do is just find a bunch of defense. The hard cast is three BBB chairman. And I will say, for this deck to hard cast Citadel is a lot easier than the other deck you played featuring Bolas' Citadel, because the mana base actually <laughs> makes sense here, despite having four colorless lands in it. I will just say that for for the purposes of that, because your other deck really had issues casting spells. Yeah, it's uh, if only we had Black Lotus and Pioneer, the format would look a little different. Uh, I don't think anyone would have one. <laughs> I think I, the, the refugees would just all leave the format. <laughs> Novice, you, you could install your Black Lotus, just get in there for five. Oh, that has real Ogo Thief of Grounds attacking for lethal in the finals of that eternal. Alright, um all joking aside, let's let's actually uh get you the games unless if anyone has any other deck questions. It means you have to share. Yes. Right. I'm still going to try to maximize this, y'all. Let's see. All right. Skype, Skype sort of sucks, but it's the best we can do. Is there a way to, like, remove the surrounding stuff? I couldn't figure it out last time. Get rid of Wait button next to Dom. There are another thing I can clear out. Cage stops you from losing the random stuff. I mean, it's hard. It's a hard sell to put Cage into your Bolus's Citadel deck. It's Senator instead of like Pithing Needle. That's what I'll say. Obviously, like it's not the end all be all. That it's wrong, but there are issues. Um, is there a way to get rid of surrounding stuff in Skype? Anyone know? If Skype weren't so stupid at taking up the entire screen. All right, did we figure it out? No, oh, I'm still sad that I can't figure out how to get rid of like the other parts of Skype picking up the entire screen. No, it's okay. People will uh people will live with it. And yeah, they 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 may or may not F eleven. No, uh, it's already full screened according to that. Can you just move that to another window? Do you have another window? The black, uh... the black screen. Oh, the bit with you? Yeah, yeah. we'll right. talk that away. I, I don't know if you get this too, but there's a weird feeling where like, you start out X now in a tournament, and then you lose, and make it into top 8, and then you lose, and it's like, well, I haven't won a match in like 4 hours, but I'm meant to be happy because I top 8 at the event, you know? It's like, it's a weird, I don't know. Uh, and conversely, you know, you start 0-1, and then you win seven in a row to top eight, and then you lose again. It's like, well, that's just a totally different sensation, even though on net, the the spread of wins and losses uh, is the same. Yeah, it's very weird, especially at PTs. If you start like 0-1 and, or 0-4, and you end up 4-4, and you sneak in a day two, you feel great. On the other hand, if you start 4-0, then go 0-4, it's like, what the hell am I doing? All right. Anyways, um, let's see what you got. Round okay. one, game so one. First game of Vintage in months at this point, uh, yeah. th since January, I believe. And well, I mean, yeah, I... <laughs> obviously going to keep this. I kind of feel like scouting or knowing what your opponent is on is mm -hmm. actually a lot more important in some ways in Vintage than in other formats. Um, where like you need to know how fast your hand needs to be, and right. often. You know, a card like Fuzzlestorm is either one of your best possible cards or completely blank, and you don't know which until it's too late if uh, you're just uh, gambling on it. So, well, so to, to the Fluster Storm point, I actually think the only matchup where Fluster is completely dead is actually Shops, 
Because a lot of the bizarre decks try to interact with your permanent save with Force of Vigor. Yeah. Or, it, like, the, the squeeish or the, uh, you know, bluish builds have a bunch of forces as well, so... It, that, that's the thing, is that I think that's why Fluster is so popular at the moment. It's not just one of the best cards in these blue mirrors, it's also... <laughs> against one of the other pillars uh, in Bazaar. Like, I have three in my main deck. I bought in the fourth because yep. I need to defend my needle from a Force of Vigor or whatever, so... Um, yeah, so I, I think you keep blind. And my the real question I have is, do you play fast or you play slow blind when your opponent keeps seven? So there's a bunch of ways you could play this hand. I think the slowest way is just, you know, Island Top Go, or Island Top Lotus Go. The fastest way you could play it is Lotus... Island, Crack, Twister, and see what happens. Yeah, I don't know if there's much merit to to burning my Twister here just yet. Mm -hmm. um, especially if if it turns out that um, my opponent is on also like a slowish blue deck, then sure. Twister with Fluster backup may end up being a better route there. So I could just go Island Top, or I could go Island, hold up Brainstorm, and Fluster, right? Um, to have access to that without having to uh, crack my Lotus. I end up going on the top. I don't think I knew what they were on. Uh, maybe it will become clear as I uh, remind myself here. But So um, that was a Tundra Fluster. I didn't even catch the third card, actually. Uh, I think that was uh, Swords. And so okay, seeing uh, yeah. Blue fetch into Lotus, I'm thinking this second Fluster Storm is going to be uh, money here. Yep. The plow is like, very unexciting, obviously. You're yeah, probably so... going to end up fetching and step in topping again. Exactly. Ooh, Vamp Tutor, probably just let it go, honestly. Because, like, yeah, I, I would be inclined to just get to go and foster whatever they get. So, okay, two-part question here. Yeah. When they go uh, Crack for Underground Sea, Vamp, EOT, A, what do you think they're on? And B, given your answer to A, what are they going to be getting in all likelihood? Doomsday and Doomsday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, that's I, I literally thinking, my answer. I was thinking it's Doomsday, and yeah. either this is Doomsday itself, or it's um, like Fluster to protect a Doomsday potentially. Mm -hmm. um, the real thing that that scared me and gave me pause was if this is Doomsday and they're fetching Necro, because in a oh, Bloomer, sure. I think like Necro is kind of shockingly difficult to interact with at the moment. Mm -hmm. I would basically need to have exactly Force Plus Blue card, which isn't all that unlikely. But think about that compared to. Uh, Doomsday itself, where you know Force still gets it, but then also you know Fluster potentially can fight over it and so on. Um, and so, if if they get Necro, I think they're and it resolves. They're about as likely to win the game as if they get Doomsday here. I think. Um, and so I was thinking, with perfect knowledge, if I was my opponent, I would just be getting Necro. And so I did think long and hard about uh, Flustering here to the point where. They probably could read me for exactly faster, but um, I think that's a, an assumption they probably have to make in the dark anyway. So I'm just kind of bracing for impact here. And so they ritual. And I wonder if there's a case for like burning right. the first fluster here. But So I, I was going to ask that if you think they vamped for Necro and you fluster there, it means they can't play the Necro off the ritual mana, but they could just crack the Lotus to play it anyway. So. Or, sure they, what... yeah, or, or they can play it slow, right? They let this go, yeah. and then next turn play whatever they sure. treat it for. So I think that's an easy uh, pass there, but worth at least thinking about. And so here is a Doomsday. And so the question now is, do you even try to fight over this? Because on one level, I have Twister, and depending on what they get... Oh, I see. Yep. Yeah, there, there are yep. outcomes where... Um, uh, we can just deck them with Twister and we have two yes. ways to fight over it. So, yeah. like, we we fluster the first draw effect, assuming it's something we can fluster and not, like, a Street Wraith or something. Right. Um, and even if it is Street Wraith, at some point in that process, unless the stack is, like, exactly a bunch of Wraith into Oracle, there's going to be, like, a Gash or a Recall or something in there and we can try to fight over that instead. Yep. Um, the issue with that approach is that uh, they have in play Delta Lotus, uh, so if this is a doomsday pass a turn pile, um, there doesn't need to be that much left over in their hand to open up the line of uh, crack delta, crack lotus, 
do something else. And now there are eight cards between their library and their graveyard. And so I've effectively done nothing to undo their doomsday and they're just going to win with whatever protection they had on their turn. Um, so, but then if I try to fight over the doomsday, the first flaster they can just pay for, and then they have the second flaster, um, which if they have their own flaster, then that doesn't work. But then it feels like they're going to be on empty afterwards. So it, it, what, what would you do, do you think, in this spot? I think I would crack my fetch and spin top first. So if we're doing that, what are we trying to find that would... Uh, is it just exactly forcible or it's forcible well, even i think like maybe hole breacher might be good enough depending on the exact scenario but so i mean the, the problem with hole breacher obviously is that it costs you off your man to cast it yeah so what i was thinking was if i have to spend both of these pluses this term it's going to involve cracking my lotus and ideally i want to do that at a point where I, I'm going to spend two blue mana here. I'll have one left over either to brainstorm or to top and then to shuffle okay. with my fetch. Um, so I kind of want to preserve this delta as long as I can. Okay. That being said, if I'm trying to maximize my odds of just finding force, then maybe the line is crack the lotus and spin and then reevaluate going from there. Like I could brainstorm, um, crack the delta and then top again afterwards. So, so that gives me a lot of looks at a force. If that's what I think I need exactly. Um, the other thing too, though, is if I just spend a bunch of resources this turn, like um, I, I could win the fight over Doomsday and then the second Doomsday, right? Could just do me in or uh, I, I think their deck is probably better in a total deck situation than mine is. Um, I, I, I don't know, but... So I, so I decide the, to... Yeah, yeah the, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say... This also makes sense because I think increasing the storm count for Foster might just yes. tap them low, low enough. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're supposed to brainstorm before or after fetch because you know you, you know there's a dead plow on top, but if it's like plow, good card, good card, then it might just be better to brainstorm off the Lotus. Here you just, I guess it might just be three good cards, so who knows. So at this stage, I remember thinking, I'm actually setting up for this time twister double flustered line. Oh. Um, which I didn't realize until potentially too late was not it, actually going to work yeah. given these constraints. Because once yep. they once they play the first ritual, right, they already have at least eight cards yep. uh, kind of in this orbit. But um, so actually, I guess this is getting shuffled in, but uh, you know what I mean. So I draw these. I think that actually helps weirdly enough. You want to... Uh... Well, I guess the question is what you put back. I would probably put back C preordain and put the preordain on top and just fluster storm this and see what happens. Yeah, I think I end up putting the C back on top on on the grounds that if I do need to twist her, then I don't want to have to flip my top for it or to waste a mana that I might not have spinning the top again to, to get it back up there, um, assuming I have to crack my Lotus on this turn. Yeah, makes sense. Not fostering is interesting. Yeah, so I, I'm kind of uh, committed I, to this plan, not realizing that it won't work. Yeah, I, I guess that's a tough one to see. Ooh. So let's see. Hold on. They have one, two. There's five in deck, two in hand. So the fetch just makes it eight, right? So, yeah. So Very it awkward. would... Um... One, two, three, and then eight in deck, yeah. All right. So I miss up the preordain, and then they fluster here. So they did have a fluster. So at this point, uh, the storm count is high enough that my own flusters, you know, fluster is just hard counter on anything, even through like a ritual left in hand or whatever. Um, so I don't know if you do this. I personally don't. You can technically look at the entire exile pile and compare it to a list. Yes. You can find on Google. It is so much work. It is technically correct to do. In paper, I think if someone do this, I would just start sorting their deck and see if I could figure it out. But I think that probably would get me a slow play warning as well. I uh, w One of my favorite magic clips of all time is, uh, I think it's P.T. Charleston, where 
one player casts a Mimeo Fracture. So this is a card where oh, yeah. you, you target something and you get to search their deck for a copy of it, <laughs> but you don't get to see their hand. But of course, yeah. if you know their deck, which yeah. is the top eight, so they did, you can deduce from the content, from the contents <laughs> of the library what their hand must be. Um, and so, yeah, you, you see a player like speed running that process, trying not to get a slow yeah. play warning. Um, I, I think succeeding in the end. I, I think it's just outrageous that that was even allowed like, even in a top eight, like, I mean, I, I guess if they took under, like, whatever the specified time would was at the time, that's okay, but you're, like, you're at home, I guess technically you could write everything down in a spreadsheet. I believe you did not do that. Correct, yeah. Um, <laughs> had I done that, uh, I, I think that, you know, you, you, can, you know what the uh, base contents of the pile are going to be, like, there has to be at least one oracle. Yep. There has to be at least one way to continue finding cards and so you scroll through this pile you see uh two copies of street wraith in exile and so depending on how uh three excuse me so like maybe there's a fourth one in the equation there somewhere um this is where like you need to have that in-depth format knowledge where you need to know what the stock doomsday list looks like what the different variations look like so that you can reliably deduce that um assuming there's no like recent list on goldfish or whatever they put an underground C into the pile because of the fetch land. And yeah. There's the fourth wraith. Um, sting. Sting stuff. So I think so, you might be dead through these flusters. Yeah, th this is what I was assuming. Um, like, oh, they're down to two. One of these cards is going to be a wraith or yeah. be an oracle. And then maybe like the card underneath is an oracle just in case. Right. Uh, something like that. So I figure maybe I just completely screwed the pooch on this game. Um, but then they probe me, and now I have an opportunity to actually use my fluster. Oh, and now now you're priced into it because I think yes, if, if their well, top card, well, I mean, if their top card is literally Oracle, and they see your hand, they're going to kill you. There's there's no question. And you spawn top. I didn't actually see what you spawn into. Yeah, so I see Vamp as oh. the third card down, and so that makes it easy now because I can Vamp on upkeep. Oh, I, or I can draw Vamp for Ancestral, yeah. flip for Ancestral, and then... Just see if they're dead and cast yeah. out their upkeep, I guess. On their upkeep, in case their one card left is like a fluster or something, and yep. maybe they then don't have the mana left over, so... What a uh, goofy game. Yeah, right? And this is turn three. This is... <laughs> this is the appeal of Vintage, I think, is there are so many decisions packed into just a few short turns there. Yep. Um, and I definitely flubbed some of those, uh, but ended up kind of... Uh, Snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, but then snatching victory from the jaws of that defeat. So it was a <laughs> kind of a weird game uh, from that standpoint. Yeah, I don't really know. Uh, let's check out how you sideboard real quick. I Obviously, I don't think you sideboard much because no. you cut the plow, put the needle, and you cut the echoing truth, and you probably brought, it, brought in... Uh, Fluster you... and two forces, yeah. Oh, cool. Maps perfectly, I guess. Yeah. Perfectly the only designed thing... deck. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, the only other thing was, do I want the lantern as like a an onboard redraw or something that maybe can interfere with some stuff uh, sometime, like get in the way of a dig or whatever? I decided the you know the worst good in my deck didn't need to come out for a lantern, right. but maybe that's a, a debate to be had. I I think I'm anti lantern too. Oh, Jarvis. Wow, this is uh this is a very vintage <laughs> hand, is how I would put it. Yeah. If someone dies to this hand, I would describe it as getting vintaged. Uh, I was uh, doing a lot of vintaging and then eventually getting vintage well, myself so uh, the, throughout this tournament. The only issue with this hand is your only blue source is Black Lotus. But yes. this is, I mean, if you're mowing this hand, you probably should just not play this. So, <laughs> right. I mean, I shouldn't play this one anyway, but, you know. No, 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 no. So, so what my upkeep, uh, they go for Recall, which I believe I force pitching probe. I, that's probably it, you either pitch probe or you pitch. Actually, there's a case for time walk, I think, but probably not there, with Urza Saga is the actual yeah, issue, right? Th there is a case for time walk. I figure I'm actually fairly happy just burning the lotus on the time walk here, um, just to accelerate into you know future modes of the saga where if they need to take any turns off to set up, you know, the contract tokens potentially can get them dead and then. This can even fix my mana by getting the Sapphire if I need it, or uh, just a top to see more cards. Um, so I'm happy making those exchanges. I'm not actually sure drawing another Mox is what you wanted. Interesting, you didn't cast the Lotus. Oh, the cast of Time Walk? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think this is because um, 
you know, if if I draw any blue card here that I want to cast, like a preordain or something, then I can now do that without feeding price into fetching a blue source with the saga. Um, and there's definitely a chance that I die here and like would have wanted to cycle through this to maybe find something else. But if I don't have a blue source, what kind of defensive measure it, could I actually yeah. come up mm -hmm. with, right? That's exactly uh, what I was about to say. I'm not sure there's like much you could actually do. And obviously it sucks if you die, but whatevs. Right. I think by sacking the Lotus for blue to cast Time Walk, you actually give up a lot of good top decks, is how I would put it. Yes. Which maybe is the case for keeping the probe over the Time Walk there, right? Um, but so they DT, and I figure like maybe this is Lotus into something else. But then they just pass. So I don't know if either they don't have the the payoff yet. Um or, and the DT was finding that, or if they're setting up like a more defensive turn, um, where you know they find a fluster, they find a force, and then next turn is going to be the big fight. Yeah. So, it's... but oh. it turns out I just okay. Well, you just lethal them. <laughs> Draw the best card of my deck. So, yeah. uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, manifold key costs one mana. So, if assuming this time lock resolves and the time bolt resolves, our opponent has been put into the abyss of infinite. And apparently they're put into the Abyss of Infinite Turns. Great! Was this, this was one of your four, right? Yeah, see, Jarvis, just great gameplay, great uh, format. Um, don't know why people don't do this more often. Well, IRL, there's a very real reason why people don't do this more often. That's for <laughs> sure true. For many, 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 many good reasons. Yeah, yeah. Many. Um, anyway, so, interesting dilemma right off the bat here. We have a revealed card. Lewis of the Dream Den okay. has entered the Exile Zone. So, so this, uh, you know, back when Companions were first released, Lewis completely took over Vintage. Oh, yeah, yeah. Had to be banned. The one card because of the, <laughs> you know, Companion mechanic that ends up getting banned. For, like, non-dexterity, non-anti reasons. Yeah. Um, but then uh, gets unrestricted or unbanned, excuse me, a few months ago and doesn't really make an impact. Uh, you know, at yeah. first, People really lean into this card hard and then moved away from it. Um, and you haven't seen it much since then. So seeing this revealed here is kind of intriguing and makes me wonder exactly what's going on. And it's like... So my, my take on that is it's usually like Remora Breach of some sort. Yeah. The, so what what Loris actually tells you is, first off, they can't have Tinker sit on their deck because obviously that's off the table. Also tells you you don't have to worry about whole return Narset to Fairy Three Mentor, so that actually narrows it down quite quite a bit. My guess would be like three or four color breach, with Dragon Rage Channeler and Loris. Mm -hmm. So I have to put back either the fourth land here or the needle. I end up keeping the needle because it seems like I probably won't need the additional uh, land, and mm -hmm. if there is some kind of needle target, then putting that away could really end up screwing me over, and I don't want to like have to fetch out with the saga even if that is an option but there is still a likelihood that after going to six i've now effectively gone to five because this needle is not going to have useful targets so justin said it could have been white weenie that yeah that, 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 that is wild to me that that is that's a thing that people are going to do themselves but so interesting spot off the bat hit i can either play saga and set up for turn two uh next land soul ring activate saga yeah. Or I can play land and pass, or I can, you're yeah, holding up Flasser, or I can play land, play Sol Ring, which is what I do. Um, I'm thinking the line here might actually be not cast a Sol Ring yet, just like hold up Flasser, next turn I can play Saga, use that to cast a Sol Ring. Um, but then maybe Lurus suggests that if I think this Sol Ring is likely to resolve, I should just play that off the Saga and have this online sooner. I think I probably would have done that, but... yeah. It's whatevs. Well, we'll see what they actually do. The, the problem is, Loris is not that frequently played, and not all of the Breach decks play it, because I think about, if I had to guess, half the Breach decks still have Tinker Citadel, because it's just such a good way to, you know, win the games where you don't need your graveyard, essentially, is how I would put it. Yeah, I think the, the crucial lesson there is Loris heavily suggests no Wasteland. Yep. Right? I mean, if it's the yes. White Weenie deck, then they're going to have Wasteland. But, okay, sure. Um, so with that in mind, I think the Saga is actually a lot safer and probably would have been worth playing. I think my issue was 
if the soul ring gets countered or destroyed in any way then i'm gonna have no ability to activate the saga for constructs and so maybe even given that playing it safe is better there that's an interesting draw yeah so now i'm thinking so now i'm thinking i can set up tutor for tinker untap tinker with flask of backup just as a you know a perennial threat uh hanging over the game here so the, the question is do you play needle here I believe I did, yeah. Well, so I think you should. Oh, no, I did. Okay. Well, so there's a few reasons, too. A, obviously, like, maybe you get them. Well, obviously, you're probably not going to get them. If you get their flood strand, that's a huge one for you. B, I think you would rather tinker away the Pithing Deal than the Sol Ring in case of something weird happened. Oh, yeah, that, that's a very fair point, which I, I should have been more cognizant of, I think. Uh, so they cast Time Walk. So they, they miss a chord for Ancestral. They cast Time Walk. I let that go. Doesn't. I mean, it's just Explore. I mean, it's like Explore, untap two lands. What else? That, that does sound like a Burden Chini maneuver. Um, two Explorers. Well, no, just one Explore and then it's free. You know, you actually gain mana, right? If you untap more lands oh, that sure, you're sure. already tapped. Oh, their hand is powerful. Yeah, I, I'm thinking I'm just getting vintage on at this point. Um, well, I mean, time to see if you can vintage them. There's no reason yes. to wait, I think. Your hand is so... What? Well, the... So wait. the 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 reason to wait is okay. if I want to get full value out of this saga, because um, if I pick this fight, which admittedly I should have done with a needle in play, because then I get to keep my soaring around, can activate the third chapter here. But I think my logic was... Um, you know, this is hanging over the game at any point. If they had some kind of broken play here, they probably would have gone for it. Like, it's not really getting better for them. Um, and having these two constructs means I can put them under pressure to the point where maybe they have to pick another fight somewhere else. So I draw scroll, and I scroll for force. But I think I should have done is... I guess I was still a little concerned about them having some broken line um that i would want fluster and force back up for but i think maybe i should just scroll for force and then also make a construct i think that would have been better and look how at no point here have i had a good opportunity to cast my needle right if i'm gonna do this i guess i could do it now off the saga and probably should have done again but oh so they just have a bunch of reactive cards would be my read yeah and so I get Spell, spell Pierce, Pierce, which is uh, kind of devastating. Well, not that bad. Like, I mean, it's not great, but also it's at least just a one for one instead of getting your draw. Well, oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's actually really funny. I don't know what's going to happen now. Uh, so I assume you just float, right? Uh, I would assume so. Oh, this is weird. So you're Tinker... Wait, why did... Okay, if you're going to make a Construct, I don't yeah. think you should cast Tinker this turn, right? Because then if I get flustered, I can't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the other reason is, I think if you draw another blue card... <laughs> they just have another what? Spell Fist. Why yeah. are there so many Spell Fists in their deck? Just a mono Spell Fist gamer. And they have uh, Force Negation. So now I'm just, I'm just on nothing. It's a Construct against the world... This needle uh, isn't doing anything, and I think this game actually goes on a little bit longer, but I I pack it in pretty quick here. Because I mean, at this I'm, point, it's not yeah. like I'm redrawing to anything especially good either. I, I think, like, your best pairs of draws would be, like, Hole Breacher, then a draw seven. Right. Name Polluted Delta. Is there a Polluted Delta in your deck, or is there only one? I think there might be a second, but I figure once they have basic swamp, they probably have four delta themselves. Oh, sure, sure. That was just a really funny exchange where I think, like, basically, if you had just taken, like, some more coherent line, it would have worked out a lot better. Yes. I, I guess, so, I interesting uh, uh, updating your prior question here. Once you see the, f the first spell piss, should you respect the second spell piss more or less, <laughs> given that information? That's a complicated question. I'd probably respect it less because, of, like, how do you have room, right? Well, that that's kind of what I thought. I think. Yeah, I mean, obviously, getting spell pierce right there was devastating. But like, devs. Uh, I even can cast this thing. Honestly, like, 
Maybe not. Oh, but you did find a time twister. So if this one resolves, it's actually like, oh, it did not resolve. Wait, are they going to literally die to this construct? That would be really funny. Uh, spoiler alert, no, they don't. <laughs> but they're so close. Oh, th this. Oh, never mind. It's not. Oh, wait, what? What is their deck? It's just. It looks like Esper control. control. Yeah, Esper yeah. Lurus control, I guess. That's, uh, yeah, whatevs. But I think we're getting to the replay bug where, like, it starts crashing, so I don't want to restart MTG. No, no, this was just where I conceded. Um, oh, okay. Although, right. <laughs> my also, I, can't, I think maybe I, I still had out technically, but realistically, you know. So I, I think I just kind of zoned out and wanted to, to move on. Their deck looks really weird. I don't see a lot of decks that look like that. That honestly looks like a modern deck to me. I will say, uh, <laughs> going into, like, round seven, uh, when I was looking at the standings, the top six were all it, it was me and like five of my opponents and then this was the other opponent just like languishing down in the you know x4 bracket or whatever um I, i'm not gonna lie their deck looks like a modern deck and it's not even a good modern deck so <laughs> right I mean, so obviously I'm, I'm i'm being a little bit facetious so let's let's be clear but i i don't understand what their deck is doing so far Maybe there's something good going on there, but it doesn't uh, look like it. I mean, it's just Snapcaster you, Plow, Ancestral, I don't know. I don't know. I think if you task me with building a deck like that, I could come up with one that I was happy with. But um, this is the kind of deck where, you know, Saga can just win the game by itself. Yep. That being said, if I see Lurus, I'm thinking maybe they have Dress Down. Like, that would make a lot of sense to, sure. to pair with that card. Um, so I see Mentor, and so... My plan immediately becomes just, you know, yes, find mentor. a good spot to fight over this mentor and then have that run away with the game or have it clear the way for, for some other, like, backup threat. Uh, someone asked in chat, should we expect Celestial Colony now? I don't think even the modern players are <laughs> going to do that th to themselves anymore, so. Ooh, Preordain's actually a pretty nice draw. I was kind of afraid he would just run out of action, personally. I, that yeah, I, I was a little worried about that too, and I'm almost wondering if I should even be casting these blue cantrips rather than just you know, holding I, them for force and setting up a big fight. Well, so I think what I would do is just not cast them and just wait to draw lands naturally. Yeah. Or if you're about to miss a land, then you cast it. What I would have done probably. Yeah. So I end up uh, preordaining into two mocks and, and putting them both on the bottom. Yeah, it's just like not that good, honestly. Like, I mean. Well, what you could do is, if you drew exactly one of them, is play the Mentor with Fluster back up next turn, which is sort of appealing. Well, like... Yeah, I, what, what I was kind of thinking about was, um, yeah, it was exactly that, is draw one, pick this fight a turn earlier, and have Fluster ready to go with misset forcible backup, which seemed pretty good to me. The nice thing, too, is uh, the way these Fluster fights line up is, mm -hmm. if your initial threat is not able to be flustered itself the best they can do is fluster your later counter spell and then if you have another one ready to go then you can you can fight back so what you don't want to happen is let's say this was a tinker i go for the tinker that gets flustered yeah. and now i can't actually meaningfully fight over it anymore um so you know what prismatic vista is a very bizarre card to see i think i don't really see that one almost ever in vintage either so maybe yeah. they're just like, I don't know, back to basics. Something I don't, I don't really know what's going on. I don't. No, they can't have back to basics. Of course, Alaris. I, yes. I, I, I can't tell you what's with this. It, it does tell you no mystic sanctuary, probably. Um, but yeah, that that did raise an eyebrow for me as well. So do you go when tap C for Solring mentor? Uh, I think I actually. I, maybe I was a little worried about um, like spell pierce on a force or something. I think what I do is I just go for soul ring and then I'm going to pick is the fight it, next turn. Is it is it doing the slow replay thing? Maybe because because that also means that if I draw another spell, I have something which once I stick this, I can immediately cast that and get a monk out of the equation, and I'm not right. open up to them just like untapping and sorting it or anything like that. So just draw another land, which is kind of unfortunate at this point, but makes this fight easier. And it turns yeah, out yeah, I don't yeah. need to fight because it just just resolves. So Weird. you'll have to see that. And They're now if they try and kill it, it yeah. yeah, I can get into a big fight and just have a bunch of monks left over, even if it resolves. 
They say mentor goaded. Who's they, Jarvis? Who says that? Uh, the people who are restricting mentor, probably. Okay, so they, they passed back without doing nothing, and now, yeah, I'm... I mean, I, I, what are you going to do except cast your spells, right? Like... I, I'm very confused as to what they could possibly be holding. Um, I'm almost a little scared, because it's like, are they just not caring about this because at some point they're going to mm -hmm. cast six spells in a turn and bury me somehow? Um, Surprise, they have Tendrils of Agony in their worst control deck. I've seen some really weird builds of decks in Vintage over the years, so that would not like actually shock me. I kind of think Vintage is actually a pretty fun format to build decks for, and the gameplay itself is less interesting a lot of the time. Like Justin, in, in uh, when uh, the Mythic Society did the weekly Vintage, rest in peace, uh, he would show up with some wild decks for that. Uh, but then, you know, the gameplay itself would actually just be a little, you know, little sus. I don't know. I find draft gameplay to be generally pretty good, honestly. I guess it well, depends on what you're into. If you're into attacking, blocking, honestly, then it's pretty good, generally. You see people say stuff like, oh, my favorite thing about drafting is we'll, we'll do the draft, and then I kind of wish we could just compare decks and decide on a winner instead of playing the games. And to me, that suggests that your format actually is not that good at that point, because, like... Mm -hmm. The gameplay should be fun, and if it's not, then you know what's the point. But uh, turn five, Loris into hand, <laughs> say go. This is engaging gameplay. This is effectively their first game action, right? Like I guess they cast a mox. I don't That's understand what's spell. going on. What the fuck is? What could it be in their hand? I I literally cannot figure out what this person is doing. Right, it is so I, I'm bizarre. Like Ninety percent confused, ten percent terrified. <laughs> I mean, honestly, your hand is so stacked to defend these two monks that I kind of think they're just going to die to these monks. So, the, honestly, the game has been going on for so long that these flusters are actually not that impressive anymore, right? So, I was about to bring that up. Do you just save Vamp to add plus one to Storm yeah. to both your flusters instead of doing this? I don't oh, know. Okay. That, that's a good case. I decide to just, like, do it now to get two more damage through, get the extra thing and i just go for tinker i believe yeah i don't know i think it kind of doesn't matter what you go for to be quite fair but you're cracking both of your fetches because you might need to cast four sand plus for now right and i don't want to then shuffle away yeah 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 exactly um yeah i think this probably is replay bugs so i'll restart moto and then yeah classic motos So I started doing this, and not that you should or have to. I just record every round in OBS, like just locally. Yeah, I I mean, I did not anticipate having a stream-worthy finish in this event, so uh, yeah, of course. was not doing that throughout these early rounds, but uh, certainly something to think about. Yeah, I mean, you can just start doing it, and then if it doesn't work out well, then you just... Okay, well, one second. Let me... Uh sharing and then stop reshare. sharing yeah and then stop sharing close it out reshare all right got any questions in the chat any questions for me any any donations or subs or follows remember if you want to support the stream hit that follow button smash it smash it you have a question? Nice. Thanks for the follow, Alpar. And Sayer Lowell and Big Stano. What did team? It's Sanito Etor and Soaps. What's the question? Eli? What we got? I wait for Dom to do whatever the thing be done. Ooh, what's the best deck I've ever played at a PT or two? Eli, is is this just a, a long con to get Jarvis to say goblins? Yo, XJ, welcome back. Thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. Uh no, that's actually a good question. Let me Okay. I actually have a spreadsheet that probably answers this question. Of course you do. Well, no, because at some <laughs> point, before they sunsetted the PWP site, 
I wrote down every deck I played in a premier level event because I knew it was going to be too hard to figure out. That, that's pretty cool, though. I like that. All right, so it's a it's actually a flip. There's actually three contenders for this. So the first contender is Lands GP Seattle 2015. Obviously, it's like kind of hard to argue with the result there. Second tender is Absan Company at Pro Tour Atlanta. We won't Go. talk about that one <laughs> because Dom was defeated by my one of Stony Silence in game three on turn look, two. Look, okay, look, if it was a Kataki and the whole point was you put one in your deck so that you can call a calling for it, fine. But the one Stony Silence, Jarvis? Really? Anyway, well, so uh, anyway, it, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, I'm over actually, it. I'll, I'll tell it. you. I'll tell you the quick reasoning for that was I wanted a second Ozer versus Finny, but didn't want to play a second Kataki. So I just played a Stony instead. Because yeah, if you draw a Stony and a Kataki, it's better than playing two Katakis or two Stonies. So if you have it all, is what you're saying. Yeah. Anyway, uh, third place. Third place is uh, well, it's it's tied with lands. It's Ren and Six Delver at Grand Prix Atlanta, uh, right before COVID. Oh yeah, that that deck, that was, deck was I mean, like I think probably more well positioned and more broken than lands was ever. It just everyone else knew it was broken too, so it doesn't like pop out at people. If that makes where sense. Would, where would that rank on the list of all time busted Delver decks in Legacy? It's probably about as good as Grixis Death Right. Like, I mean, like, they're both very good decks, and they both have unique strengths, weaknesses. That It's, like, kind of hard to compare to two, but I think the win rates for me with both of them are fairly comparable. I might uh, pose that question to Legacy Twitter, actually. That sounds, uh, you know, nice. <laughs> just, just you, uh, call some discourse. You call some discords, farm some clout, you know, do whatever Hashtag you want to do. It's a good anyway. question. You might want to credit <laughs> Eli for asking me with it in Twitch chat first. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, so game three. We we didn't officially finish game two, but they took I, no I more assume, actions than I assume, the game. <laughs> what I kind of assume is they're really flooded, actually, after having watched all those turns. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, curious. How do you side in this matchup? Do you do you leave and tinker? I assume you do. Actually, yeah, I, know, knowing your personality, you're always going to leave and tinker so at all. Actually, and knowing yeah. my personality, I also do the same. I don't really have stuff to take it out for is is part of that. But also, I think I differ from a lot of blue players in Vintage where, like, I basically always leave in all of my top deck tutors, which is something not many people like to do. Because I figure these games are often not decided on raw cards, but about winning a particular fight. And mm -hmm. the tutors are very good at winning, you know, setting up or letting you win a certain fight. So, um I mostly just keep all of those in uh, all the time. The other nice thing too now is uh, that Vamp in particular can get Urza Saga. So you have yep. a a threat you can fetch that doesn't actually get like forced or flustered or blasted or whatever. And if their plan is to let the Vamp resolve and then, you know, leave you down a card effectively by hitting whatever you choose it for, then the Saga can help to sidestep that. I agree with you 100%. The fact that, uh, well, this is, well, actually... I was going to say this is not a cubable hand, then I'm reassessing this. Yeah, I, I decide to keep this. Um, Actually, I don't hate it. I mean, like, cause... Mox Sapphire is basically an island. No one forces a Mox. Right. Plus, you have so many good topics. This hand is, like, fairly busted, actually, is the actual counterpoint. You draw a single land and two draws because I assume... I kind of assume the probe's going to resolve, too, frankly. And, and even if I miss, like, what's the worst that can really happen? You know, I have Force and a Fluster to fight yep. over basically anything. Um, I do need to hit another Mana Source event eventually, but it can even be a Mox at this point, because I have the Sapphire, so... Do you play the Mox first, or the Probe first, is the real question. Uh, I think I just Probe them first. Yeah. I think it's close. Uh, what do they have? Quick. Wait, does it not show in a replay? I don't think it shows on a replay. What the hell? What is the point of that? That makes this worse. Uh, no, they misstepped it. That's what happened. Never oh, mind. they misstepped. Sure. Okay, no, 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 never mind. We're, we're good. It's just the fast forward actually fast forwards to the misstep. What does it tell you if they misstep a probe? That they want to hide their hand? I don't know. It doesn't really tell you that much. 
right? Like, I, I don't think you can actually do this that much, except... Yeah, I, I, mean, I is, it's so hard. Is that a play you would expect to make, you know, absent any other context? They probe you, you have a misstep in hand. Do you misstep it? Oh, yeah, question. I guess that probably means they have, like, a bluster that they want to hide. I had to guess, but it's... I'm not confident on that, because I think... There's a lot of people who just are like, ooh, I could just win my misstep. Let's misstep that, right? Yeah, I, I think Chubby Rain in the chat is right that it yeah. probably means conditional interaction where yeah. the value of that known information is actually pretty high. Right. Um, so but Fluster, like I said, does make sense. Or, or but... actually, against their deck, specifically, Spell Pierce. Oh, yeah, Spell Pierce. You know, I imagine it's this person be played mix. two Spell Pierces in game one versus, uh, versus, versus our hero here. Where are your lands? Time to cast well, Spiridain. Hopefully they're getting discovered by this Spiridain. So yeah, I find uh, two lands, keep them yep. both, and I'm feeling pretty good about the game from this point. So the Brainstorm Snap resolved. And they didn't shuffle for Stunning. Right? Because they just played a fetch and said go, so that means all of their cards are good. Yeah. I, I wonder if... Um... There was a case for trying to fluster their brainstorm. Um, mm. Probably not, especially no, if it involves I, shuffling away this land. Well, the other thing I want to do is just try to set up Pole Breacher with two forces yes. behind or something like that. I don't know. Like, I think Pole Breacher is your plan. And if you spend a fluster on a brainstorm, like, what do you even really accomplish, right? Right. And with that in mind, maybe you're just casting this time more course was a mistake then, because it's effectively just cycling yeah. it. Um, that that, that's what I was about to say. I think I would just say go and just EOT, EOT Breacher and see if it works. What I think I actually... I Maybe I did this even. What I kind of wanted to do once I time walk was a vamp and if it resolved, get a Saga. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because then I can I can yeah. play Saga, play Breacher with Fluster backup and have Force ready, and then I have Saga as another you know highly impactful threat. You're just going to draw Saga here. I hope so. That would be fun. I draw Time Vault. So, yeah, I go for Time Vault now on the grounds that because I have this vamp hidden to set up the key, I can try to pick a fight over the Breacher and then, you know, suddenly vamp key untap. And that's that's just three mana. I have that already. And yep. so, um, and I don't think they would counter this Time Vault absent anything else. What I can also do is, uh, I guess... At this point, the vamp is lethal anyway, so they would just counter the vamp. But if they somehow yeah. let it resolve, I could get the saga, right? And then play for a longer game where in two turns I get the key. Hello. What is that? Someone's oh, cell phone. Spam caller. Oh, it, it said like hello. It's just the the moto like default ringtone, I think. Oh. That's very terrifying. Oh, look at Jarvis, look at this. Okay. So I, I sense blood. Yeah, I sense you're gonna cast Fall Breacher in response to Brainstorm <laughs> and they're gonna be really sad. Oh so I, cool, cool. Well, this is this is this used to be a uh well now you really make them super sad. <laughs> Do you remember the first time this happened on SCG coverage? Uh the the Jupple versus La Lauren Nolan uh where there's a uh, I think it's Lauren's holding Notion Thief, and Jeff Wolf just puts a Jace on the stack oh, and yes. brainstorms. Yeah. And then, like, picks up the Notion Thief, picks up the Jace, and just, like, is very <laughs> sad. <laughs> it never really gets better. Like, now, now your opponent's just full blown dead, obviously. Yeah, the, the game is over. I even have all of these treasures in case they have, like, a Fluster or something. Is it time to vamp? Yeah, I vamp on Alkeep. Oh, yeah, you just have more mana. Yeah, they are... I th unless they have, like, Durbin's Veto or some nonsense, then I think they are deterministically dead. Oh, Jeff Foster was a table judge. So uh, someone in chat says the, the table judge basically lost their shit. You know? It's kind of hard not to, right? <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I mean, they have one card. You just cast the thing and they're dead, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's... I mean, well, let's make sure you actually get Manifold Key, I guess. Okay. Easy. 
All right, cool. 2 0 so far. Uh, I still do not understand their deck, and I guess the deck list never got published, right? Uh, it would need to be in like the top 32 or whatever. Okay. So, so no, well, let me ask you if your opponent's name is Turn One Tinker, do you think they have Tinker in their deck? 100% like Mishra's Workshop, Bizarre Baghdad. Yeah, some. Uh... Really? I bet they have Tinker in their deck. I would bet so much that they. I mean, th this is a pretty good hand against the Taiwan team. Yeah, no, no, no. I, it, this hand's... Unfortunately. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> you already knew, though. You already knew. I, w I was spoiled oh, by, by being Ooh. there playing the match. An actual dredge with grief? Yes. Nice. Which is it's terrifying because I think my deck is pretty well equipped against, like, generic bizarre deck. Yeah. But against uh, against specifically dredge, I am um, I have nothing effectively at least in game one. So, um, so you brainstormed. I kind of think you should have just scrolled, but maybe scroll is too soft to cabal therapy. That's not worth it. Right? Scroll for like ancestral yeah. or I don't know. It didn't maybe. matter. You were probably gonna lose no matter what with that start. It didn't yeah, really matter so what you did. I never know how much to prepare for actual dredge because yeah. you have some people like Canister, spoiler alert, who always play it. Um, and then it seems like for the most part, people don't really pick up dredge. It's just the people who always play it like to play it. And so it seems like they're never a, a big part of any given tournament, but it generally seems to do pretty well is the impression I get. Like it did really well in this challenge, in the showcase, uh, but didn't do great in like the, the very next vintage challenge. So I, I don't really know what to make of that. So, well, Canada's like 50-50 to play Shops or Dredge or Bazaar or something. Side out, you know, I think you saw what you punted. This is what I was talking about for. You're supposed to have Sphinx of the Steel one in this matchup. So I already have the the other big robot in here, and I keep the Citadel in my deck. Yeah. So at that point, like, am I meant to have all three? Or no, is no, the, no. I, the think Bite over Steel, the... I think Bite Steel is often not good enough. I think Sphinx is certainly better against uh, Default Bazaar. Against uh, Dredge, I think they can actually like set up a board that goes through a Sphinx enough of the time, um, which can also happen with Blightseal, but I think that's more right. likely to happen with the Sphinx. Um, but maybe that's a, a misunderstanding of the matchup, though. I don't know. I kind of, I kind of think, well... So nice. not keeping this... Well, no, no, you should keep it. You just needle there. Oh, I am keeping it. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I've... sorry. We should actually do this probe first and see if it's safe. Well, let's, let's look to see if it's safe. All right, cool. It's that safe. Is. Yeah, Woo! so you just, like, put them in the ground instead. And, yeah, I 100% agree with playing Saga this turn because what you want to do is just, like, layer piles of disruption versus them, which I assume is your plan. Yeah, so oh, I'm actually... So I kind of have nothing left, but neither do they, and so... Well, you're going to have a Construct plus a Tutor for... Right. I kind of think you should get... Yeah. It, it was that or top, but I guess Soul Guide Lantern just means you're so safe. Ooh, another Saga. They're probably just insta-dead now. Yeah. I, I could technically get a second Needle, but there's actually... At this stage, there's zero difference between one Needle and two, unless I also have another appealing Force of Vigor oh. target. Um, I was about to say, I think getting the Soul Guide is better because in the case that they do have Force of Vigor and you can't counter it, you just crack the Soul Guide to draw a card instead. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And also, because I get to eat the Dredger, yeah. like, one reason that Needle is a lot less reliable against uh, Dredge is if they get the first Bizarre Activation, often they can just start slow dredging, right? Like, doing it manually with their draw step, and that can be enough if, you know, you kept a weak uh, hand on the strength of a needle, so... I, I think generally that doesn't happen that much anymore in Vintage nowadays, especially if you have Urza Saga in your deck, because it's so easy to stop that with, like, two Constructs or whatever, right? That, that's fair enough, yeah. All right, so game three on the draw. Do you adjust I, sideboarding is the real question. I, I do think uh, Grief is a pretty big upgrade to that deck. Um, yep. If for nothing else, because it's Icarid food, but also, like... Um, in the list that do have bridge from below, it triggers bridge. Uh, yeah. It's just, it gets around like force and negation specifically it, uh, and fluster. It's just a, you know, really useful card there. Um, I think I bought it out a whole breacher on the draw because it's like, as I said, as a default case, this card is not as good as you want it to be against dredge. And then especially on the draw, like it's just uh, not really getting anywhere. Um, I'm I sort of interested in you having zero plows in your, that's still correct after having put, 
I I really don't know. Um, because I, I do want to have access to that answer to a hollow one. Equally, though, I kind of figure, like, the way I win the, the matchup is to just do something completely busted that goes over the top of, like, a single hollow sure. one. Uh-huh. It's kind of tough to say, though. Uh, so, I mean, this obviously keeping game. this hand, I still think there's a pretty good chance I lose the game with this hand is a scary thing <laughs> with this matchup, but... Well, they didn't spread a dredger. That's a really good sign, first off. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to see it. So uh, you to see should, this too. You, you definitely should lead with Time Walk, I think. I yeah, think I would have played Saga Sapphire. Well, well, well very specifically, oh, I'm doing force this. Yep. Yeah, I don't okay, want to get forced because uh, after I see no Dredger, this whole Breacher actually is good now. So yep. this now is my plan more so than the Needle, if it resolves, if the Time Walk does, which it doesn't. So now I am a little in danger here have got to hope that uh nothing materializes they just play another bizarre and pass and so this was uh at this stage the most interesting decision i've had in the tournament i think okay so let's so, think about what's going on here i guess yeah so what does this mean i think it means first of all they don't have a dredger right because otherwise yeah. you would dre uh bizarre once and then bizarre again try and dredge a bunch of cards it likely means uh, like at least one reactive card, so a force of something. Yep. And maybe they're like waiting to see what they need to bizarre for to line that up properly. Um, so I guess question A is, do you even vamp here, right? Is there a case for just playing Saga and then trying to snag one bizarre activation with a whole breacher or, you know, what, what, what do you think the line is here? I I think I personally would not have cast the vamp because of all of the reasons you listed after thinking about it. I think it's just a lot safer. Like, so the danger of not casting vamp is, okay, if the Saga and Mox get evolved, it's not great for you, but then you have a Breacher in play, then you untap and play Needle, and then, like, I kind of think you're fairly safe by that point, right? So, so what's the line in this case? So if you hadn't vamped, I think it's obvious. And now that you have vamped, it's kind of tricky, right? I think maybe what I would do is just so, go get, like, Anna Crypt or Sol Ring? Probably so I, I guess my issue is, um, let's say I play the Saga and pass, intending to hold up Hole Breacher. Yeah. They cast Force of Vigor. At that point, I have to cast a Hole Breacher. They yeah. get two full Bizarre Activations, and then I've lost two of my mana sources and they get to, and if there's a dredger anywhere in there, they can use the trick that I mentioned before to sure. bizarre through the whole breacher. So I actually sure. think there's a decent chance that that line means they just kind of go off on their turn. And if they hit any uh, like Nark Amoeba or something, oh, yeah, then sure. this therapy is potentially live. And especially if they find like a second one and a second body somehow. Um, so what I end up settling on is I vamp for fluster, I believe. Oh, I see. Or Lantern, actually. That uh, that doesn't actually play around all of that well, right? Yeah, so I think my reasoning was, okay, I go for Needle, and then yeah. if they have Foff immediately, then it's kind of an issue. Um, Yeah, maybe this should have just been a flusser, I guess. Yeah. Mm. I'm kind of curious that they kept this hand that appears to sit around for a while. Not sure about that I, either. Th well, I, I think this is the issue with the Bizarre decks, is I don't know if you can mulligan a functional hand that has a Bizarre. Sure. Um, so I think my logic with the Soul Guy Lantern was... If they have uh, something like this... Um, yeah, then it's a lot better for you to do this. Yeah, because if I got Fluster instead, I Fluster this in response, they get two activations, and then, all right, they, they no longer have their bazaars, but again, potentially, you know, if they've dredged a bunch of cards, it's, it's an issue for me. Whereas this way, if, if it's forcible or force negation, I draw this out on the needle, and then... The lantern should be good enough to. Yeah, I, I think now it's probably good enough because it would 
Plus, with the whole breacher behind, I think it actually is good enough. I think sometimes this might not be good enough because they can do the classic thing of, okay, make you crack it because there's like an Icarid and like two bridges or something like that, right? Right, right. So I'm so curious cool. exactly what the the best line would have been there. Um, I think you can also make a case for getting Lotus, actually, because then sure. um, I can do, I can cast Breacher huh. off the Lotus if I need to, and then, you know, in, in a way that doesn't let them force the issue with uh, a Force of Vigor. But I don't know, it's an interesting spot. Um, I think it's pretty clear that they have reactive cards in hand because they didn't yes. activate Bizarre and discard any dredgers or like bad cards. Trust me, so, the deck has a lot of bad cards they want it, in the graveyard. It does. So, so maybe the Fluster would have been better there. I think yeah. that's still a, a spot I'm kind of unsure about. Because I, I figure if I get to untap this turn mm -hmm. without anything too bad happening, I'm good. I, I'm in the clear. I just need to minimize the chance of something awful happening right. at exactly that moment. Mm -hmm. So now they bizarre and um, now now you see if they're dead, and yeah. I guess they didn't and, want to play anymore. <laughs> well, well, the nice thing about this setup too is, even if they have a dredger after the first oh, activation yeah, you... and get it in the yard, I can just pop the lantern, and now I'm guaranteed to get the second activation. Um, well, also if they have to pass, you just reset with Twister, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I uh, managed to to get that one. That felt pretty good. And so three and zero oh going into round four. Where are the end bosses? Where are the canisters? Oh, they're coming. Don't you worry. So I know this opponent tends to play PO. And oh, I'm this hand's really, really, really good versus PO. Like, feeling good I mean, about this hand in that context. Yep. Yeah. So again, the eternal question of when do you time your saga? I figure, so with the time vault, yeah. there actually is a pretty strong incentive to gun for this as fast as possible. That being yep. said, there is a chance that they just do something butted on their turn one, and I need exactly. to have the fluster, the fluster up. And I think I can afford to like take a turn off and play towards that, potentially scroll for like a force at some point, just to set this up. And the oh, ruby makes yeah, that a lot yeah. easier. I was going to say, I think what I actually would... It, well, it's too late now. I think what I would have considered doing that turn is play Saga, Ruby, and play Time Vault. I, yeah, I think that's also like a very solid line. Maybe what I should have done. Um, huh. I end up getting a second kind of line of defense here, and so sure. they're not doing anything for the time being. So are we going to like slow play it? Oh, that's actually really good. So now I guess we can really just slow play and force just play at a flash speed instead. That's absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It. I mean, that is one of the appeals of Hole Breacher, and actually, I like Hole Breacher a lot more in legacy than narset than other people do because of the timing aspect of it i think it makes it a lot harder to play around generally speaking uh, yeah and specifically with the sagas as well like uh yeah. you get to pass your mana up and it's innocuous as opposed to uh a red flag and then also if they don't do anything the base the whole breacher or it's not a good time to pick the fight well you just make a construct force yep. the issue and often if they do have, let's say, a, a bolt or a sword or something, they have to go after the construct to, to not die to it, and then uh, you can you can time the whole breacher there. So, and I think I decided to just drown the breacher here. I think I would. I mean, yes, yeah, blasted, it, and I let that sure. go. Like I, I have no desire really to fight over that at this point. You, you have four of them in your deck, and like it's honestly not a critical part of your play. It's really more bait than anything else. They don't know that, of course, and also maybe their hand is like very ill suited to fight against it. You don't know that, but. Yeah, so I, I go for the NASA thinking if this gets blasted, it's kind of the equivalent mm -hmm. of trading that for what would have been the Force of Will, except sure. it's one card instead of two. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if it's not that, you maybe it's their own Force of Will, in which case, uh, same thing. Um, but otherwise, it's quite hard to deal with. And so I have the static effect protecting me from like a you know double PO turn or some nonsense like that. Right. And then if it resolves, there's a decent chance that this just finds another blue card, and then I'm in the same spot I was, except I have um, a Narset on the board yep. ready to go. Agreed. So I, I figured that was that was better than just passing with the Construct activation up. So I think here you are supposed to foster this, yeah. Yeah, and I believe I do. I mean, it'll get attacked down in two turns, but I think that's fine. I mean, the, the game is hopefully ending Yeah, I agree. Turn, right? I mean, so... it, I mean... Yeah, exactly. They have to fight over this with force. And next turn, I think you should just go for the throw it again. Personally. Yeah. So, 
this actually is kind of scary now. Like if their last card is PO or Tinker or something, then sure. so I just have to cross my fingers. Um, but the thing is, let's say I'd kept the fluster or whatever, and uh, they untap if they have a PO, they just start their turn with PO. I can now only fluster for two, and they just pay and then you know potentially still go off. So um, you know, same thing for Tinker. So I figured that was a good spot to use my fluster. And if they don't have the force there, then obviously it's uh, straight to resolve the Narset. And so now I just want to draw a blue card, right? And so I draw a blue card and but. yes. Oh, GG. They had an ancestral actually behind, but it was not good enough. Okay, so sideboarding in this matchup, uh, Force Negations, Fluster, and... I <laughs> that that D's doing. Oh, yeah. I don't really <laughs> want to be picking that fight in this matchup. Um, and board oh. in the Sword Guide Lantern just as... Wait, you know, wait, wait. Hold on. You don't, you don't want to tap out for three mana for Days Undoing that ends your turn? Well, especially against a deck which they can board in their own Hob Reacher sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. Like but That's kind of the funny thing is if the whole Reacher deck is good... It means there are probably enough other hole breaches around that the whole days undoing angle is even flimsier than it was <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> yeah, I I think that is just. Uh, wow, this is a relatively good hand as well. This Love is, to see it. I, I would call this a powerful hand. Ooh, that's the wrong half. Yeah, that that, that spooked me for a second. I was like, uh, am I? Oh wait, no, that no, that's, no, that, the that, that's fine. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you should just lead on probe probably. I think. Do I actually hold the? Uh, I think I hold it for my force negation. Oh, that also makes sense. Never so I kind of don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I would like to know, but if this doesn't turn up a blue card, I I want to keep my right, fluster right. and be able to you know to fight twice because I'm just looking to get to the point where um, you can defend this resolve. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, Urza Saga really did change how some things happen. Not crazy. Ooh, Mox Opal with no Metalcraft, love to see it. A classic of PO if you've ever played oh, yeah. the deck. I'm sure Justin can tell us a lot of horror stories about that one. <laughs> and so th this is a spot um, where I could just pass. I think I decide to like, like an Ancestral, interesting. Yeah, this is a, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Hercules Recall. And I'm that, like, okay, well, this is potentially dangerous, right? But at the same time, I've cards. got force and uh, yeah. Whatever, so, I just let this go. Like, sacking your Lotus to counter it is basically the same thing as getting Hercules recalled. Right. And all they do is play Narset. And so I decide to pitch the Ancestral to my force, I think. That's so goofy looking, which is but I also weird... think is also correct <laughs> given this hand, actually. Right. Because I, I figure if I let the Narset resolve, then the Ancestral obviously is blank. Um, and then the Narset could turn up like a flood, you know, I, I don't know what. Um, something which either lets them go off this turn or something that makes my life miserable. Um, the way that I get punished for this is if they had like Tinker or something rolled up and now I've just burnt my Force Negation. Um, right. So that maybe I meant to, to not do that. Uh, but I, I think I like this. The other issue is you can't really use Fawn on your turn to defend. It exactly. just doesn't work. I did actually do the math here because I'm going to have a two, three, five, eight. So I could actually Vault is two, Fluster is three, Fawn is six, and then Key Activation is seven. So I could actually just hard cast Fawn on my turn, um, um, maybe which I think maybe is what I was meant to do. Um, but this is like you don't but care instead, about this whatsoever. Now like there's, now, there's literally nothing they could have. Yeah, here. they're now they're, they're in the barring the like dumpster. mind bait trap, which I please tell me I play around. I guess I have fluster, so who what even cares? Talking, but... like, you, <laughs> you you don't even have to pretend it doesn't exist this time. You just know it doesn't exist because fluster. You're rebooting again, right? Oh well, no. Modo just threw a tantrum and disappeared. Oh, okay, um, so well. <laughs> I'm going to get some water while you reboot the client real quick. Uh, you know, vintage is sometimes great, but water is greater. That's all I'm going to say. Hydration bot. That hydration bot.
All right, I have returned. The Dom disappear. Well, let's see, are there any questions in chat? Yo, Dark Apprentice, to answer that question, I think, uh, Dom lives in Toronto now, so that seems unlikely. Uh, XJ Cloud, honest answer: Start playing lots of Magic since two thousand four or two thousand five, then you'll be approximately as good as I am. Okay, are we back? All right. Yeah, someone asked you if you played at the Bearded Dragon. I told them you don't live in New Jersey. Uh, or, or ever, in fact. Um, but I, I had to go there for uh, regionals a few times. So oh, right. for a while, I was the defending New Jersey, uh, New Jersey regional champion. <laughs> but no more. Oh, SCG champion. Yes. I see. All right. So that. Oh, Numot played that that showcase. I did not realize that. Yeah, it was uh, I, I played him in the four no bracket. It, well, it makes sense. All these decks are basically just vintage cube decks, right? Yeah, I, I didn't even know how much vintage uh, Numor played, but they had enough results on Goldfish that I was pretty sure what they were playing. So uh, I know this Paradoxical? is another PO matchup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that would also be my guess given his proclivities. Um, so given that, this hand is actually just kind of doesn't do anything. Right? I, would, like, I don't even have yeah, a blue yeah. card for my force, so I, I decided I have to send this back. Well, this one's much better. Hmm. And so obviously just putting the needle back here. Yeah. Kind of wish this day's undoing was literally anything else. For example, Jarvis, let's say this was the Lavinia that I wanted to have in my deck after the tournament. You know, just tell on <laughs> Lavinia, easy game. Um, yeah. But but no, it wasn't. So Even a preordain, I think, would be better than a day's undoing here as well. But, you know. I think... Any random card in my deck would be better than <laughs> the, the days I'm doing here. I guess not the needle, but you know. Oh, that's why we, we know that one's on the bottom. Uh, this certainly looks like a paradoxical outcome, although I guess it could be like some other big blue deck that sort of disguises it. So this is uh, an interesting dynamic that comes up against the other Time Vault blue decks is if they cast Time Vault, in theory, you can just wait for the mana fall key and, and counter that instead, and the time vault by itself. Well, is yeah. Much. But now, you know, let's say you have a, a time vault saga hand. If if possible, you play the time vault first. Yep. If that resolves on that basis, now you play the saga, and now they are really dead under in the three. gun. They have, yep. Yeah. Or actually, they're dead in two. Right. It's not three. It's like, three chapters, yeah. which is two turns. It, yeah. It's not check, but it's like mate in two, right? Yeah. <laughs> I find the same thing happens when you play against Hammer in Modern. It's just like, well, their thing doesn't, their Sagutter Zay doesn't do anything. Then you play Urza Zog and you're like, God damn it. So, ordinarily, uh, uh, previous, th this would be the worst card in the, yep. in, in the deck, right, to draw here. But because I have the Saga, I'm now thinking, hmm, hmm. We actually do have a plan. <laughs> it's in two turns, we'll just put all of our chips into the Citadel, or in one turn. We'll see if they're dead to the Citadel, which is kind of nice if you think about it. I mean, honestly, that was like technically one of your better draws, I think. Maybe, yeah. Oh, this this has to be all right. Yeah, this you cannot counterspell this fast enough. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're dead, you're dead. Whatevs, right? And a lot of game actions were taken from this point. Oh, this is probably checkmate. Yeah, or you yeah. decide to concede. I think I do concede. Yeah, and, and this is. Part of the appeal of the PO stuff yep. is like you do have a subset of not draws like this. Um, 
don't know if they're worth it on balance, but like I, I, I understand the case for it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it has pros and cons. I just think there are possibly more cons than pros right now, but obviously I didn't test for this tournament. I only gave input in discords when people wanted it. And I kind of think I'm right about some things and I'm not so sure about other things because you actually have to test. Yeah. This hand, on the other hand, is pretty good, and I would actually just fire out the whole Breacher on turn one, personally. Yeah, I have actually found that um, that kind of collaboration, like if I'm feeling in a funk with competitive yeah. magic, just being able to help out others or test on, te you know, test with them or offer mm -hmm. ideas is, you know, or create content, in my case, is like a good way to get satisfaction out of the game without needing that to rely on doing well in a given tournament, which is nice. Um, Anyway, so new one welcome to six. And so there is a question, firstly, of do I lead on Saga, do I lead on Hole Breacher? And then if I'm going to lead on Hole Breacher, this is a spot that came up a few times and I wasn't quite sure how to navigate it. Do I just jam it now or do yeah, I, I wait and try to catch something but then risk either, you know, let's say they have like, they lead on Probe. I kind of want to tag the pro, but then if they have ancestral in response, I just look like a dummy, right? Stuff like that. I, um, I, I think generally in this spot, I would just slam the whole breacher and not think about yeah. it. Because I think there's just way too much that can go wrong if you don't do that. Yeah, so that that's what I did. And so now I have another interesting decision of, do I want to try and jam Tinker? Right? So I, I, I don't think you should do that. I think you should just play the time vault and see what happens and not use up all of your mana that way. Yeah, and very specifically, I should play Time Vault first before Saga yes, to, yes. Wait, to present wait. that dilemma. Yeah, exactly. That's the dynamic. Wow, you have a lot of top deck tutors. I, I sure do. <laughs> all right. So... And I decide not to attack because it's PO. They play at least one stamp caster, and yeah, yeah, yeah. losing my whole breacher for no reason doesn't seem like a great use of my time. So. Uh -huh. Wait, so this indicates you're going to... You did it in the wrong order, Dom. Well, yeah, I, I think maybe once I had the two top deck tutors, my reasoning was um, I want... I, like, I'm kind of fine losing this because let's say this gets forced. The way now is maybe clear for Tinker. I think the issue there, though, is once I commit to playing the Saga first, I now, like... If one of these gets misstep or something, then I have to do it on my upkeep and it gets a little thorny. But um, I, I still think I should have just led on this before Saga for well, no, so know, the reasons we outlined. Yeah, it's kind of weird because exactly that is the problem, right? Because that is the color of a slam, not a blue or black clan. Right, because like if they, if they had ended up countering it, then oh. the Saga is not great, right? Uh, okay, so the, the other thing that was an issue here was... Um, because Numot Saga will go off before mine, if there is still a needle in in his deck, he yeah. can needle one of the time vault pieces. And then that kind of puts me in a bit of a bind. Um If that's what's happening with this saga, I think you're there, but I don't know. See what happens, I suppose. Cause another thing I can do is vamp for the key and just cast the key if I'm worried about uh because that goes a turn underneath the saga but then that opens up the key getting countered and at that point this saga now does not represent a uh, serious threat anymore yeah. yeah so there's this weird back and forth with this in the matchup so in a weird way i kind of feel like i'm more under the gun than numot is but then this is the thing right is would you leave the one needle in the deck which in general is not a card you want against a whole breacher style deck just for that contingency. I guess it could also, you know, if it's a saga fight, then you make some constructs and you need all their saga and uh, that that might be a good exchange for you. But in general, I don't think Neil really does too much. So I don't even know if that's a threat I have to respect in this position. Which I would is, not uh, respect it. And I also think Numot would not have that card in his deck. Okay. Like that, that's literally what I would think straight up, honestly. I, w I think it's like, that that sort of thing, I think, is just playing to try to get out of weird corner situations. Whereas, if you have a more streamlined focus deck, you'll win slightly more often. Well, Chubby Rain, the issue there is I don't have a Yorgwell in my yeah, deck. Yeah, the, the issue um, is there's no Yorgwell in the deck. What, what what I can do is also is Mystical for Time Walk. And then, again, that gets me a turn before oh. the cycle would pop off. Actually, that's um, interesting. So, you probably should do that. 
So that, yeah, that potentially is a yeah. game winning threat. So I think I, I don't think I do do that. I think I should maybe have done that. Okay. Yeah, no, no. I think that is very appealing. I mean, like, obviously, if the time walk gets countered, who cares? Like, it was going to get whatever. There, there is a, a weird coda to this, too, which is that um, because I have a mana crypt, key itself is not deterministically yep. lethal, right? Um, but, I mean, what happens in those spots is you take, like, a damage for a little bit. What generally happens is you just tinker it away at some point. Yeah, okay, so I vamp... Oh, you do get the Why time Why did I walk? vamp for the time walk instead of mystical? I don't know. That's weird. That is weird. I think maybe I, I was going to vamp for something else and then like change course mid-vamp and then was wishing okay. I could you know, take it back to, to switch them over. Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely should mystical there because vamp can go get other things that... Oh. Oh, they're dead. And also... You can't actually die to Time Bolt because I think the Construct will kill them before that. For a Mana well, Crypt. Okay, so... No, because you have two 4-4s, four right? Alright, so I get Fluster here thinking, alright, I've got a, you know, defensive card lined up. What could possibly go wrong? Urkel's Recall. Until... I get Hercules. And then did I Yo, not well, have the mana? To... No, there's no reason to replay the time bolt right now because you're taking an extra turn, right? Yeah, I. Oh, okay. So I was trying to think of: is there a way I can get this back down without needing to recast a time bolt and then open up this issue again? Um, right. And so already, I'm kind of exposing my key to like miss up or something, right? With with this approach. Um, I think I just end up deciding that's a risk I, I have to take. But it, it's tough, though, because if this doesn't go off against this active saga and three cards left, I actually feel behind again now. No, no, um, I think I think putting the key there is correct because it costs you the rest of your mana to defend Vault with Fluster, if that's a thing. Although, I kind of think but there's no like, way they well, have a counter because they would counter one of the pieces on that turn cycle because it's safer to do so, right? Right. What is there that counters the Vault that doesn't counter the key? Is, uh, is the question there basically nothing i think so with that so in I, mind maybe i, I meant think, to like not do that but well um i guess they could have like another Hercules is the other other thing that could actually be going on which would make sense as well right i yeah i guess i, I think but it, it's also loose as hell to have multiple Hercules in I guess maybe Numa doesn't know that. I wouldn't even have the first Hercules in, in these semi mirrors because I don't think it actually does anything. Well, I think it has some more value now against Saga, right? Yeah, Where it's not great. In, in these reactive games, you do need to alter these constructs, and um, it can like break this up in theory. Or if they do Tinker for Citadel, like sometimes you get to bounce sure. Citadel in response well, to the have, first spell. Have I mentioned our Lord and Savior address down? I dress, yeah, dress down. Uh, I think dress down nice. would be a cleaner answer and also like a more reasonable one. Also, it gets around the Lavinia issue if that's actually a thing people are doing, for what it's worth. For sure, yeah. Gets around this guy as well, Hallbreacher. Um, yeah, I think I think it just does just enough that it's appealing to play like one or two copies of. I wouldn't want like a huge number of them, but there's been a bunch of times it would have been useful. So I now mean, this it, that doesn't matter. That literally doesn't. Oh, oh, well, sorry, it could, but I think it's yes. unlikely to. I think generally it doesn't actually. That, I mean, yeah, you could die to it, and it would suck, but it's so unlikely. Also, that means you have to not draw Tinker or a way to get rid of it, or just not enough threats. What else? Yeah. So. Wait, why did Numan did the replay break? I think the replay broke. Um, yeah, this think, is I'm my assuming... other issue with Moto nowadays. Why does yeah. the replays randomly break? I'm assuming I cast Mentor and they scooped. That, that yeah, make... that is my assumption. So I mean, they, they should still play it out in theory, right? Because I could lose. Because if you tips. don't draw enough yeah. spells before that. But I think it's just great. so easy. Like Even if you draw like a Mox, you can just put Mox in a second before some negation in. And that's generally good enough, right? Right, right. Ooh, Ozymandias. Yes. So this is game three, which I remember oh, no, being no, I see. kind of a wild one. Okay. 
Okay, well, I'm not so rolling right in this hand. Bat, this is, <laughs> I mean, it has high upside, I guess is the phrase I would use. I would not mulling in this hand. You would have to pry this hand from my dead, undying fingers. I think the fact that I can go like jet ring into top and spin and then have this left over and yeah. can walk if need be, you know, that's a lot of redraw to the nuts, I suppose you would say. If someone mulligan that, I would just like look at them and be like, what, what, what do you want? Like, not every hand's going to have force of will. I also actually like casting time walk before spinning the top, honestly. Mm -hmm. And so now, I guess the question is, are we setting up to time twister on our on our own turn? Probably, because you just had so much material, right? Okay, does seeing any of this change that for you? Not particularly, because like the issue is, I mean, force mitigation is nice, but you would have to wait. So you would have to wait another turn to do that. And like then they get to de deploy more stuff, maybe. I guess the like, danger of casting Twister now is you know they don't have a bunch of fast mana. You could give them some. I I really agonize over this because I I kind of want the saga in a way. Um, but then I also a, a lot of my good draws post Twister either are going to have a saga regardless. Or they're going to have Academy, which could then let me chain into other spells. Um, so it's it's a weird spot. Th again, think about if this Days Undoing was a Lavinia, right? And yeah, I, just I get know. To... <laughs> it's just, it, it, this Days Undoing has been bad, and it should feel bad, and it's really not surprising that... It, I, I could see just putting the fawn in your hand and saying go and spinning top again. Yeah. Whoa. Why did you do this? So I oh, do no, this. I, I guess, so I guess th this makes is... sense. So the idea here is I want to have my land drop left over in case it is yep. Saga or Academy. And if it's not, it's probably another fetch. And so, all right, we, we can play that either way. If this gets countered, I now have Force and a blue card I can flip into. Um, oh, I see. That makes sense, actually. Oh, no, but it's Force Mitigation. No, no, I mean, I let the Twister get countered. Oh, I see. I see. On their turn, if they go for a, a PO or something, you know, I can... I can do I so, can do that. So just to, this is my new seven. Just to check, you have two UCs in your deck, right? Two UCs, two tundras, Correct. two islands, Correct. An academy, and some fetches. Yeah. So what do we do? Uh, I don't know. Like these cards are not that great for doing anything fast, honestly. Uh, right. So probably what I would do is just play land go and see what happens. And we can you, spend. Yeah, we, we can spin top. One line I thought about briefly was Crank Tarn for C, Vamp for Lotus, Flip for Lotus, Lotus Hull Breacher, and just hope that that... <laughs> but I, it seemed I, I'm dicey. I'm not sure that's even better than vamping for Tinker and just seeing if they're dead next turn instead. Because you can you can vampire the Tinker and Merchant Scroll for like a force or a fluster. Yeah, I think that provisionally was my plan here. Yeah, and And so... If you needed to get a counter, you could because you could just vamp for a force and draw it with top. Not that that's like really appealing or desirable, but that is something you could do, you know? Yeah. So this is not a, uh, an impressive follow up from them with a new hand of seven cards and then, you know, the card they drew from their turn. So it does make me wonder what's going on. And so the most likely answer is going to be either a bunch of lands and or reactive cards, right? Mm -hmm. So. I did think, is there some merit to trying to play it slow and like, we don't crack this fetch now, we spin the top, we can then mm -hmm. crack the fetch, get a new look. But then this saga also is placing me on something of a clock. So I think I end up gunning the vamp. I, I think... Oh no, I just... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. This, makes this also sense. makes sense. So I think you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you could... Uh, let's see, can you vamp for Tinker? I guess you can. Why? What? Okay. Oh, I so, see. Yeah, I, okay. I upkeep, flip to draw the flaster. Now I'm going to vamp for, I assume, Tinker. Yeah. So I guess you just read them as weakness instead of anything else. Which, yeah, was kind of a mistake, I think. It's kind of hard to say one way or the other if they're weak or not. I think I would have probably played it slow and tried to, like, EOT, Holebreacher, then, like, get into a fight over it, then, you know, 
slowly drain them and then you know finally you go for a dinker later on you know so i guess since you're here you have to fluster right? yes oh worked all right top here we go was this maybe this wasn't the interesting game after i don't know this does not look very particularly interesting to me i do I think like it that was... i do like that you did not play the mana crypt off the thing because I yes think that is a way you can very easily <laughs> lose well, well also i think at this point i don't actually do i have the truth no the truth is in my sideboard i don't have a way to get this mana crypt off the table so i was like whatever you do <laughs> <laughs> do not play that matter. Oh, I see. If you don't have a way to, yeah, then just oh, like, I guess oh, I, 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 I guess my bonus to Citadel is a way to to get the mana crypt. Yeah, off the but tape. the problem is, if you're at that point, like, aren't they dead? I don't know. Right, right. Yeah, so I don't know. This, kind of playing it this, slow. this does not look wild to me. This looks like actually very pedestrian. Yeah, I, I might be thinking of another game here. I mean, I guess if the saga does something impressive, what did it do? Oh. Oh no, they cast it. Wait, what did they even get? They got Mana Crypt and they played a top. And then you force mitigation there to Fairy, and then the, I assume they die this turn somehow. Uh. Maybe? I think they I, have enough walks. Wait, is the Mentor I, gone? I find the Time Vault at some point in here. Oh, that, that, okay, I just have the Mentor. And then the actual question was am I going to lag out somehow? Because my laptop was bugging out a bit at this point. Um. Oh, Court of Calls with the raid. Thank you very so, much. Shout out to Court of Calls. If you like Booster Draft, check out Court of Calls stream. Going from uh, AFR Limited to Vintage is a bit of a, a radical shift, but I respect it. Yo, well, we're, we're playing against a known Vintage Cuber. Come on. It's basically the same thing. And I do enjoy myself Booster Draft nowadays, so. Uh, yeah, Mario Breger asks, uh, what's the reasoning behind no Yorg will? So it seemed to me like Yorg will, I mean, obviously it can be phenomenal, but it's mostly in this deck only really good with Lotus. Um, and so that takes a bit of setup in its own right. And then a lot of your best cards are permanents so you're trying to maintain on the battlefield anyway. Like you're not a PO deck where you can Yorg will, you know, like buy back a PO and then uh, go nuts with that. Um, so you're kind of constrained in how good the Yorg will can be for you. It's mostly like if you already have mental or you've already, you know, had the time walk or whatever. Um, so it, it seems like a lot of the time that card is going to rot in your hand without doing much that's productive. Um, so five, no, I, I'm thinking at this point, I just need one of the next three to make it in because my tiebreakers are going to be uh, really Wait, good. How many people were in this event? It was uh, 135, I believe. Then it's a seven. No, seven it's round. eight. It, eight, no, eight rounds. Eight, Eight rounds because it's above 128 but it's so, a very small eight rounder and it's yeah. it's moto so no ids and so you know x2s are much more light than they would be in you know a paper event where okay. draws were allowed so against what i think is probably bug uh yeah fine you, hand you know him too well yeah you know his proclivities is the right word or i just check goldfish or something either way but Oh, fair enough. Checking goldfish would make sense. Yeah. So I, yeah, just go for ancestral here. I think that I kind of want to pick a fight sooner because I have two like good threats here, and yeah. So I, I'm very happy just like burning that off. Uh, so I force their ancestral. Now Wait. I draw mine and get to fire it off. And so one reload. small note: some of those bug decks play days. I think you should have just played it first. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, it's bad. just a disaster if that gets dazed, right? Like, there's no yeah, reason not... Because, like, you've traded, you've tutored for this, which is basically just plus one card by this point, because you would just spend your draw step. But if it gets dazed, you're basically, I think, obliterated. Yeah, th this so. is a little better with... Because I kind of wanted to uh, establish the saga this turn. Um, sure. And I, I don't want to get my one white source for mental wasted. Like, I'd much rather get this sure. wasted instead. But as you say, like, the, the downside there is pretty stark. And then I actually punt here by playing out the key. I figure, like, this just uses my mana in a more efficient oh, way. But force of vigor, two things. Is saying, yeah. First of all, force of vigor. And then secondly, if I do end up playing this mentor, you know, yeah. I, I want to have the prowess trigger uh, and, and the monk back for that. So, yeah, I get force. Ooh. And now... Wait, yeah. you win this game? I guess Mentor is the well, one you probably win. Mentor is a pretty good magic card, so. 
And Mentor, you know how people complain about Pack Rat all the time? Mentor <laughs> is basically Pack Rat, right? Except it actually scales even faster. Although, admittedly, it versus Leavold, I'm not sure how quickly it actually scales, right? Yeah, pretty sure Pack Rat would be better in a AFR Limited if you all were still watching that. But in Vintage, Mentor is a kind of a messed up card. So I have a lot of opportunities here to like send in a 3-3 Mentor to trade the Leovold. I decide, though, that just keeping the Mentor around has a lot more upside. Um, so what do you need all here? Probably, is it Oko? I, I said Oko, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I think Oko makes sense. Because, I mean, like, how else do they beat Mentor, really? Like, It's, it's that or Deathrite Shaman, but the, like, I, I can survive a Deathrite Shaman that sticks around for a while. I don't think I can survive an Oko that sticks around for any length of time. So, well, I mean, the first thing that's going to happen is your mentor will be an elk, and then yes. everything else happens. Ox, honestly, better than drawing a land here by a lot. 100%. 100%. It's even uh, the Mux Jet. So, if I draw like a DT or something, I can uh, fire that off. This is a weird game. And actually, this game, I think, is why I have issues with Bug. Like, yeah. It. Stefan played or uh, tested a lot of Bug as well. And he said his issue with the deck is sometimes it like does this. You jund your opponent, then you don't have enough broken guards in your deck, so it's hard to slam the dark quickly enough. Yeah, I, I guess like Bug is a deck that is less powerful than right. most vintage decks just in terms of what it's trying to do, but how its cards line up uh is the main advantage. But then if they aren't lining up properly, then like what are you doing, right? You're just spinning your tires a bit. Um is there any logic in holding a mox or trying to double spell yeah, in a later they, turn? Like, overrun, I think, I, is the I logic. Think I think the answer maybe, is no. Honestly. I think maybe, but I do want to have the option to cast the whole breacher. Um, especially now, if they uh, go for like a cruise or something, or even just you know some smaller card draw spell, I think getting to snipe that with the breacher has a lot of upside. Oh my boy. Yeah, cannot force that fast enough. You're like, that one's too big. We got We got to get that one out of here. Yeah, we have a uh, Jonathan Zhang in the chat. Um, so what we're watching here, Jonathan, is a, a fair incremental game of mid-range <laughs> round of gathering. Um, Wait, well, hold against... on. Both people play Ancestral Recall. There's nothing fair about that card. Let's 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 get that straight. Yeah. So kind of wish I had the misstep back to be able to counter that, but it's yeah, it's whatever. You know, I mean, I think no you'll deal. overpower it. I mean, you're not going to get to overpower with card draw spells. Oh, yes. Love it. Love it. <laughs> they might just trade. No, I, I don't think they should trade, but it's kind of weird. Now no one can cast card draw spells. Yeah, this oof is kind of a problem, even though actually a lot of my spells are fairly castable here, um, even though some of them won't be doing anything anymore. Like that, that one, not, for example. That one's not castable. So this is an interesting spot. I believe I send in both of my breaches. Love it. Put 100% do that. They might yeah. just trade, honestly, like... The, and the, I'm begging for the trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they should trade, too. Yeah, it's a Tarmogoyf. All of the bug decks play, like, three Tarmogoyf and one on the sideboard. For... Yeah, it, Tarmogoyf is so much better than you think it would be in Vintage because all the decks are focused on these uh, battles of the broken things, which means if you just have a Tarmogoyf and you back it up with Disruption, like, they probably can't cut the Tarmogoyf, and then whatever random creatures they have are going to be smaller than the Tarmogoyf because that's how Tarmogoyf works. And so, <laughs> you know, it, it finishes the job pretty easily. So so question is, do you even cast Vamp or end step? Not on that end step. I want to do it on my upkeep because then, oh, you know, I, I, I see. Yeah. I get the round of triggers there. So what, what are you going to get? Real question. I don't need... I think if it resolves, I wanted to get top because that's in theory like a, an extra prowess trigger every turn and an immediate look at three more cards. Okay. Yeah, I guess you just you, you have to give up the extra draw anyways, obviously, but it, it is an extra draw every yeah. turn. And so that gets forced, but Wait. I draw a pearl. Okay, and then now and you just play it. That's and actually slam a phenomenal draw. Yeah. I mean, any non-creature I... spell was a phenomenal draw, which is basically yes. most of the deck. <laughs> Because now I get to attack with everything. Mentor can't die, and all of these three threes would just would trade yeah, off yeah. of the Leobard. So, yeah, felt very good to pick up game one because you know this is this tends to be one of the tougher matchups um, for a kind of big blue deck like this. And so, it's finally, specifically I a get big to, blue uh, deck that has a lot of artifacts. Yeah, yeah. Th this is part of why I had the four swords in my seventy-five, 
just being able to transform into a more controlling deck here. Like yep. I can pick off a Tamagoy, a Leovold, an Oof, whatever it is. Um, so I brought out the Time Vault combo here because, you know, artifacts yep. are under a lot of pressure and also my Saga is probably not going to stick around. And so this is a fairly unreliable combo given that. And also I need to make room for like all my Swords and my Sphinx and, and so on. Uh, fourth Fluster comes in and Narset comes out, Days Undoing, of course, and then Time Twister 2 because... Even though there's the upside with Hole Breacher, they have their own Leovolds, right? Um, yeah, it's they just... have their other stuff. It's it's just hard to to line this up well. Um, and then I also I am generally not a fan of taking out the Citadel, especially with Saga. But again, Saga can't rely on it sticking around. And then also, um, I figure how likely is it that I'm not going to want to get Sphinx unless the Sphinx is like out of commission for some reason. Um, and it just seems so unlikely that I think it's fine having the one Tinker target in the deck there. So Justin says he would bore down Fluster versus Bug. I don't know. It kind of, I kind of think it depends on what you want to do. But I mean, like, Force of Vigor is so good, right, against me. Right. And then, like, I want to resolve my my tutors, my ancestral. I want to counter theirs. Um, and all right, so yeah, I mean, I think you keep. Obviously. Oh yeah, I mean snapping this hand off but now the question is how do i how do i play it because i i kind of want to uh work towards the saga yeah but then working towards the saga means um playing out a mark to activate it on the following turn which means then force of vigor becomes you know pretty decent there uh, i could fight over the force of vigor with a force of will but uh but you know if i lose that fight it's pretty bad in as well yeah i don't know it's like kind of complicated I think my instinct would be I would go Sapphire Priory and see what happens first, but yeah, I also have the Academy, which yeah, is exactly you know, an appealing incentive uh, if I find something to work towards. But then that also requires developing my artifacts, so um, lots of kind of uh, competing pressures on this hand. Oh, huh, so you fetched. So I guess I this fetch... place Force of Vigor a lot better to do this, right? Yeah. So I fetch uh, Tundra over Island because I now I have four swords in my deck and yeah. I have these two premium lands. So if this gets wasted, I'm kind of okay with that too. Um, draw Flusterstorm Probe. So I think what I do here is I draw the probe, play the Sapphire, and just cast the probe with Blue Mana because... I can't imagine really wanting to pick a fight on their turn unless it's exactly like um, Oko plus Days or something like that, or Oof plus Days. So maybe the two life there, like I should should pay that. But against Bug in particular, against Active Deathrite Shaman, paying two has a serious cost, which you know yeah. you can't overlook. So that that was an interesting spot in its own right. Maybe the answer is I just draw the Fluster or something, play the Sapphire, leave it up. Um, Looks like you're paying life to me. Oh no, you changed your mind. I see. Okay, what do we? What do they got? Survey says, okay, oh, so double force, force of bigger fluster trophy wasteland. So a highly re like reactive hand here. Um, and so I'm kind of hoping they draw more cards like this because what I don't want to happen is they draw a Tarmogoy for something, and now I have to slog through all of this while getting attacked for you know four damage a turn. Um, Oh, and yeah, it's definitely going to be four because that enchantment is going to go to the graveyard at some point. Yeah, so they fire off the waste, um, which I'm pretty happy about. And so now, Ooh. yeah, I, I draw the white card after I lose my tundra, yeah, which stings a little. Uh, so, another question is, what are what is our plan now? Yeah, our plan is so, Academy Go apparently. Yeah, I think I was trying to... I, I was wondering, how can I bait out of Force of Vigor just, like, on random stuff, but without neutering my own academy in the process? And then, uh, yeah, Mason Waterhouse asked, would you want to get academy wasted over Saga or Tundra? I think that's a good question, and I think, actually, in retrospect, I should have tried to get academy wasted, because <laughs> what is right. academy trying to cast at this stage, right? Because uh, if I draw something big, I, I can still commit these artifacts to just run that out, um whereas if my artifacts are being constrained then the academy also is constrained and so yeah i, I think that's a, a good question in retrospect this I, I should have led like mox academy 
preordained. preordained. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. I could even at that point have gone like, all right, here's my Black Lotus or whatever, right? You're going to try and force these. I source this, get to play for... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Wait, why did they just... They're Delta for no reason. So. Uh, they ate my Delta. I guess, assuming if I have, like, Cruise or Dig oh, in my I deck. See. Yeah, it's, it's Cruise or Dig, exactly. And because they have Catacombs Wasteland themselves... Um, they're not. Yep. They don't have a three drop. They can cast yet. Like I, it's a limiting factor. It's probably not going to be lands and graveyard for death right. Hop is actually a pretty good draw on this board. I think it is. Yeah. So I play out top, and now I'm thinking, all right, th this is quite juicy, right? If you're trying to force these and yep. uh, cut this academy down to size, and I can maybe like bait a fight with a fluster or something. So yeah, here's here's that. And because I played out the Moxon, the storm count is pretty high, and I get to just uh, fluster and threaten this. And so the trophy's gone now. And they just let this go. So they're still holding on to a force and a fluster. Yes. So they draw another wasteland, but that, that's what you kind of wanted to kind of working happen. out for me. Yeah. Yeah. So Fair this was know. Yeah, this was a weird spot too. So I top into Hole Breacher, Flooded Strand, and I think Soaring was the final card. Uh -huh. And so all of those have their uses here, right? The Flooded Strand is a white source for swords. The Soul Ring is another artifact that can set up my my saga even through a force. And then the the whole breacher is potentially just a good threat or a good counter to what they have going on and it's a blue card for my force of will so i kind of want all three of these but i have to think what order do i want them in and then also if i'm thinking of cracking the strand can i get all of those cards in my hand before that would happen uh, i i think the the soaring is maybe the least valuable of all of those Agreed. um so I actually top again with the floating mana, I think. It looks after like light. you actually put Soaring on top. And I believe I end up regretting this? Yeah, I don't love this, yeah, honestly. Okay, so I think maybe the idea was... Um, so are you going to draw a whole... Wait. I'm, okay, I'm just not going to expose my Saga yet. Let's see. So now I have... I can hard cast force off this without losing my breacher. And I can also just draw the breacher and cast it if they have, like if they rip ancestral or something. So it's a very conservative line and like maybe it's too conservative, but this is potentially basing like an upkeep force now at this point. So this Leovold is, uh, okay, shenanigans. So in response to Leovold, I spin top, I draw with top, and then I, in response, I spin top again. So I want to get this into my hand. I'm going to fight over the Leovold. And then potentially, if I want to rearrange the top and I like, draw one of these other cards first, I can do that now. Um, I think I end up just redrawing the top. Oh, no, I draw. Okay, I draw Hole Breacher. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, no, actually, it doesn't. Why did I do that? I don't know what your plan is here. I was trying <laughs> to figure it out. I'm just like, why are we spinning twice again? I couldn't figure that part out either. I, well, that part I think is just good operations. Like if you know you want the top card, then there is a chance depending on how that fight goes that you may want to um, not draw the top immediately or depending on what you see there. So that 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 aspect is free, right? Um, sure. Given that Fluster isn't in the mix or anything like that. But what I should have done is redraw top, play top, and now I still have the option of flip top the whole breacher, but then also I just have a top, which is, you know, I can spin that again. So yeah, I'm not quite sure why I did it this way. I think my mind is yeah. a little bit, you know, a <laughs> little, little gone at this stage. So it's also worth noting, Leovold plus whole breacher leads to some very bizarre rules interactions, I believe, right? Uh, does it? Yeah. So suppose you target uh, their thing and you have Hole Breacher out. Oh, they can just click no, never mind. Yeah. Okay, and they're supposed to, I think, because if they click yes, you end up with a treasure. Nothing happens, right? 
Yeah, I think... Uh, so, so there's uh, the dueling hole breacher games where one player yeah. casts like a wheel or something and then everyone just gets a bunch of treasures. Um, <laughs> but then no one has any hands, so like it's yeah. completely pointless. The, the cube classic is like Consecrated Sphinx versus uh, yeah, another Sphinx or yeah. a hole breacher or... Yeah. yeah that. So... This is where I'm thinking, all right, if they have another green card, then they're going to force her. But they don't. And so at this point, I'm actually feeling pretty fantastic about this game. because I think they just cannot cast, old cast this Force of Vigor, otherwise they would have done so a while ago, right? Yes. And, and this is a thing where if... Um, so what last turn, I, I just cast a whole Breacher... I guess if okay, t- take me back here. I'm losing track of my own <laughs> thought right, process. So, so you, you cast Hole Breacher instead of putting the strand into your hand, and then you put top underneath that. So you know the card underneath this is Flutter Strand. Well, so, I, I, so last turn I drew the the Hole Breacher instead of the top. Is that right. right? Yes. Okay, I think that makes sense just to get like another attack with the Hole Breacher in, but. Um... Yeah, and I think Matt said in the chat earlier that, yeah, the, they lost a saga in this game where their hand was just a bunch of reactive cards. And, um, yeah, so now... It's funny because, like, I don't... I, I kind of think the Force of Vigor usually trumps saga. But yeah. But not if you don't... Oh, there it is. It finally came about. They must have drawn the green card that turn. It doesn't really make sense otherwise, right? Yeah, if they had a land, they could also just hard cast the false figure. Yep. Um, yeah, they drew the green card, and it's an Oko, so like, you know, kind of glad to see that oh, out of there. Well, I just draw it, another saga, and now... Okay, that's probably, like, there's already two force figures are down. I think the deck does play four, but realistically, like, how likely is it that there's another one? Because they didn't cast the first force figure forever, so you can write that off as being in another card in hand. Yeah, exactly. All right, so 6-0, and there's only one other 6-0 in the event, so we know what that means. Was it the canister? It is indeed. Oh, the Kaniki. I will... It, it, it's funny because I've gone and watched him play Vintage a lot, and what he says universally is, I think blue decks are the best, but I hate playing. That's such a bizarre philosophy to have, <laughs> I think. I, I mean, I can understand that because... Just uh, close that Lou chat there. But I, I think it makes some amount of sense because if you don't play a ton of vintage anyway, then it's yeah. like, I could see myself saying, well, maybe bizarre decks are the best, right? But I just, is that what I want to be doing? Or honestly, for this event, maybe bug is the best choice, but I don't really enjoy playing that side of magic. So I'm just going to do this instead, right? Um, I mean, Matt went on to win the event. So, <laughs> you know, hard to argue with bug in that context. But um I kind of think Bug is probably like 51% versus almost every deck if they don't go, if they, if they don't get like vintaged out or like into weird corner cases. Because there are definitely like one of those two things can often happen, honestly. But I think Bug is possibly a little bit more stable than a lot of these like blue, big yes. blue decks. That's the part of the attraction of it because it's designed to be a gun deck that happens to have ancestral recall. And some card draw spells, you know? Yeah. The, the classic Jund issue there is if, uh, you know, your, your deck that's like 52% against everything, if there are some subtle changes in the format and suddenly you're like 47% against everything and that's um, not a, a great spot to be in. But that kind of weirdly enough, I don't think that happens that often in Vintage specifically. Mm-hmm. Because I think what tends to happen is people love playing these like creature combo decks or a why does it say creature combo? Blue combo, like blue hyper decks, essentially. And I think Bug is generally decent versus most of them if they don't get, if Bug doesn't get vintaged out. Yeah. So I, I open this hand, uh, game one, and th- this is the issue I really have with uh, this matchup is you kind of have to mulligan to a hand that does something nutty, but also you don't have the time to set up any form of protection. So you just, you shove on your one thing and if they do have the force or something, then you just get blown out. But there's no so we, real way to avoid We should check that. the exile zone, but I assume it's dredge because of yes. the serum powder. Yeah, I, I knew Cancer was on dredge already because I was in the stream and left before the match started. But, um, oh, so you're admitting to not being a snake. Correct. Uh, so 
interesting thing to note, two copies of Forcible were exiled, which changes the math pretty substantially on how safe it is to jam, right? Um, so not that I just, really have any choice, but... Well, in this matchup, I'm just pushing on them no matter what, so it's like kind of irrelevant, right? Yeah. I think, yeah, I spin top in case like I draw Lotus or something. Um... It's kind of fine though. Like next turn, you'll have a protected tinker for Citadel with the top out. That's like generally good enough to win. Yes. I mean, obviously, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, so, maybe. Okay. It, it's always maybe, of course. But yeah. So, so kept seven, of course, and then uh, I get griefed, and so. All right, time to force it. The issue though is I flip my top, and so now I don't have the third mana source here for I... the tinker immediately. I'm oh, going to have shit. it off the saga. And so I decide to flip just to get the land here because then I can redraw the top or not, uh, depending on what I think I need. Um, but they bizarre and. Okay, well, you're not dead. So what you're supposed to do is just get time vault, right? Yes. So I go for Tinker, and the last two cards are... Okay, well, I mean, it's like yeah. it's actually impossible for you to beat that, so it's like not yeah. a big deal. <laughs> then welcome to getting vintage sometimes. Yeah, Bizarre Baghdad is also not a magic card that they would print nowadays. <laughs> I, I, I love that card just as a concept and for, for cube or whatever, but it's... It is some messed up nonsense. Yeah. You like in cube? I think it's generally pretty awful in most cube decks. Oh, it's most awful time... in it's it's awful in most decks in most cubes. But yeah. the the uh, kind of cube I like to build is one where you see a bazaar and you're like, all right, I am doing some nonsense with this card now. Um, well, then I have to play your cube at some point because I've you, never you had a could. cube. Yeah. I've never had a cube where that's an appealing thing to do, honestly. Because like, was well, it I see someone put it in their deck and they like activate a bunch of times? Make some big stupidity, and I'm like, all right, towards the posture is your thing. You have no cards in hand, you're dead. Yeah, I'm thinking more stuff like, uh, you know, activate Bazaar, discard three, trigger my Riel, draw three more cards, or, you know, just like a whole bunch Riel? of. You want, to, you want to get Riel out into play first before you activate this Bazaar? You're so greedy. Play Joriel, activate Bazaar. You know, there's a lot of ways you can, uh, a lot of ways all you can right, do that. Right, anyway, right. so this hand. Like, if this hand is not good enough, I'm not sure what it's going to be. I don't but know. You, you keep and I think... It is It is actually somewhat tricky to sequence this, I think. Um, so, my question to you is, do you know if Canister has Force of Vigor in their deck? Uh, so, I saw Shambling Shell game one, and that's usually a pretty loud indication okay, that they do, sure. I believe. Um, well, is it? Because, like, aren't they actually short on dredgers nowadays? Because well, the no, they got restricted? I don't think they are necessarily. Um, well, anyway, I mean, so... Oh, well, hold on. I, I guess we'll, we'll talk about it in a second, what I mean by that. Yeah, so I think here I have to needle off C yep. just because if they have force, like if they don't have force, feeling good, obviously. Right. If they do have force, then don't want to lose a second card. Right. Um, and I think... Yeah, so they just discard blood cards to hand size, which is uh, interesting. And yeah, I, I haven't seen a dredge deck without Force of Vigor in the 75 somewhere. Like, if you if you don't, you're effectively just uh, conceding to shops, right? Or conceding to a bunch of stuff, ley line, whatever. Um, and yeah, as someone else says, you can play four Thug, four Imp, one Grave Troll, and already that gets you just about there in terms of dredge count. And most lists don't have... For Thug. So, um, okay. so yeah, the, the shell does well, tell I, you something, e e even if you didn't I was actually already. thinking that they played Thug in addition, or a uh, shell in addition to Four Thug, but if they're replacing yeah. uh, sh Thug with shell, that also makes So this is a little interesting, because you would think, all right, they didn't have Force last turn, very unlikely to have it this turn, unless... Yeah. Maybe they kept Force of Vigor and drew a green card is more likely than the reverse. But even so, it's like, do you respect that here? Or do you just, you know, carry on with your life as normal? And then, you know, they have seven cards. You know one of them is a bazaar, but then that leaves a lot of room for like 
force plus blue card at least you know one version of that maybe two um they could have grief right but they want to discard to hand size this turn and so they're waiting a turn so casting time mark i'm also casting merchant yeah so i got merchant for flutter here because now what i can do is uh vamp for yeah i vamp for tinker and now i have protected tinker for blight seal and so yeah this is a okay lock i this mean th this is where blight seal is better than since the steel one i agree when they yeah. literally have no board and there's a pitting you on a bazaar. <laughs> I cannot sure. disagree with that logic. I, I probably winning this game regardless, right? But yeah. Yeah, I agree. Scoreboard. Like you could tinker for anything and it's probably good enough. And then game three, the vintaging continues. I feel like Dredge is a deck that uh vintaging happens more than any other deck. I mean maybe shops is in there too, but like either you just explode on them and there's nothing they can really do, or you get your bizarre needle with no answer and you know you take no game action so um i figure like this this hand does things kind of no I, way would, I, I would not mug in this hand if i were you i think that would be a mistake you will lose to grief yes they should take blackboard is probably well, and they have hollow one and they kept on seven every game just you know noting well, for well, the what, what did they reveal off grief no off the throw step in that in did they oh yeah, so uh, misstep bizarre. So pretty uh, you're scary. You're in a world of trouble because they do have Stinkweed Imp, which is oh, uh, you're you're, you're you, 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 you've <laughs> lost. Uh, for those of you who've never seen Vintage Dredge, it really is quite a different beast from all of the other formats Dredge decks. Though, like presumably, it does mostly the same things. It does it a hell of a lot faster. Is well, the is the issue? It's like Dredge itself is unlike any other deck in Magic. It's just yep. its own entity. And Vintage Dredge is unlike any other Dredge deck or any other Bizarre deck. So it's in its own like unique dimension somewhere yeah. in the so corner. Did you uh, listen to the rant that Peace Only had on the receivables about that mechanic? Because it is a nice yes. one. He's like, yeah, Dredge is a mistake on so many levels. A, it's repetitive gameplay because it literally is. Because suppose you're doing the fair Dredge thing. What does that look like? Well... Is literally just the same person drawing the same card every turn. It's not very fun. And B, what they actually didn't test for, and what uh, John Rizzo and some of the Japanese figured out pretty quickly was, okay, what if we just put all these graveyard active element cards in our deck, and a bunch of like careful studies and shit, and it like actually became a dominant force and extended. We go for an entire pro tour that I will give you. Anton Ruel won that PT with blue black Psychotog, and I think if people had just had full blown dredge. Blue Black Psychic Talk never wins that tournament. Well, like, so th this is, is interesting because that was uh, PTLA 2005. Mm -hmm. And under the current uh, naming philosophy, that would have been Pro Tour Ravnica, right? Yep. The, Ravnica was the newest set, new extended format. Uh, great way to showcase what's new as opposed to, you know, the upcoming Rivals and NPL Gone, which is literally the last week of a format that people are so sick of that they had to create a different standard <laughs> queue for standard 2022, like months in advance, just so people could have something to entertain themselves. And yet this is now the format for the highest stakes event of whatever. Anyway, no, no, no need to dread on that. Um, well, it sounded like you had a rant queued up, but we can, we can, <laughs> well, uh, we can that, that was the rant. I, I think it pretty much uh, speaks for itself, but, but um, yeah, dr dredge is not a mechanic. I think that they really thought all the way through. Plus it takes a certain type of person to actually break this mechanic. Honestly, like, not every deck designer or game, like even the top level pro, really wants to play that style of deck. It's very easy to dismiss it as complete nonsense. And the actual answer is, it is nonsense, but in a very good tournament winning sort of way. Like, yeah. you, what happens every game when you first tested that deck, which I did like pretty quickly, was, oh, your opponent, if they're not doing something like actually, like, they're not catching Mind's Desires, they're not on the same power level as yeah, I, I think uh, the one exception that Patrick highlighted was Life from the Loam, and that sure. is a genuinely sweet card that is, it, it shows off the good things, or maybe the one good thing that the mechanic can do, yes. while also requiring like its own setup and so on, and the card like sets itself up so beautifully where it actually like cares what you're putting in the graveyard to, to loan back with it, right? So a lot of cool stuff going on there. Anyway, so that Pro Tour, in the finals you had 
this classic blue black psychotog deck against a dredge tog deck so the idea was you would uh give some given for like life in the loam and some cycle lands or a separate coliseum and that would be your card draw engine that would give you this advantage in the longer games um and then the the person who came closest to like breaking the dredge mechanic was uh billy marino in that top eight yep. who had this madness deck powered by the same gifts engine got got like a i think had a grave troll in there as well um so, but and, and like Craig Jones, I think, started off that tournament with like this Aiden O with this uh, Madness deck that had a bunch of great trolls, really leaned hard into that, didn't end up converting, uh, sadly. Um, but yeah, at that tournament, no one had this idea of like, what if we just went full bore on this? Like careful oh, study, okay. zombie infestation, four Cephalid Coliseum, Wonder, all of the big dredges, yeah, exactly. uh, making a gigantic Psychotog on turn three. That's an idea that came later. And that's the Pro Tour, which... Yeah, there are some like in the early '90s where like no one had an idea what they were doing, and if you if you showed up with the good deck, you would have stumped the tournament. But of like the the modern era, I guess that stands out in the top tier of events where it's like if you were in on the joke, you would have absolutely cleaned up in that uh, in that event. Um, Jay Waller asks, was Tog the only dredge payoff? Well, that this is uh, when Icarid made a name for itself, right? This was the the Frigorid yeah. deck after John, John Friggin Rizzo. Fr John Friggin Rizzo. Yeah. yeah. And so you would dredge through your entire deck, bring back three or four Icarus on your upkeep, and then, uh, you know, no amount of spot removal was going <laughs> to get you out of that one, basically. Yeah, I mean, some people had, like, Morning Tides and stuff like that, but it wasn't really for anything like that. And honestly, like, I, I kind of think once Time Spiral came out, as someone said, and especially once Future Side came out, yeah, obviously that deck was actually, like, it was completely obvious... I, I remember playing a Grand Prix in Philadelphia the same weekend as Grand Prix Vienna in Europe, if you remember this one. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, none of the none of the dredge decks actually make top eight, but I believe six of the eight slots in Vienna were all dredge. So, yeah, so it's, it, it's kind of funny. Future Sight brought uh, Narcomoeba and Dredge from below, and mm -hmm. you know, Time Spiral had given Dredge Return already, but it yep. took the deck to another level. And so... Uh, the the pro tour in valencia that got flooded out and had to be suddenly compressed into two days rather than three it's really funny what looking back at the the text coverage of that event because yeah. you look at the deck list and every sideboard is like four laid under the void and a tormal script in my main deck for my trinket mages and like a bunch of other stuff on top of that and you think well okay there were no graveyard decks in this tournament what happened to them and the story is the boogeyman for that tournament was dredge everyone knew that was just the most powerful thing you could be doing and so the format i, I don't want to say overreacted but just correctly reacted to such a point where you know the dredge players were facing this uphill struggle and then as that receded you know towards the end of that ptq season dredge suddenly became the best set to play again because it's people thought they could get away with cutting their hate and suddenly you could uh you know take you, you could go back come full circle and uh Take them by surprise again. There were a few decks that actually beat Dredge in game one, but they were mostly combo or like weird decks that had solitary confinement in them. Not that that's a card that's back in the modern, and I'm like, this card is really unfun when it's good, honestly. It's just like, yeah, kind of it's... a disaster of a card. For like, like... You, you look at some of the other things in MH2, like, okay, as a saga a bit over the line, uh, DRC, Ragavan, just kind of like making existing things better. You can question some of those choices, but at least you kind of get what they were going for there. With confinement, <laughs> it's either it's unplayable or it's obnoxious to the point where no one wants to play against it. So, like, what what is the upside <laughs> meant to be here? I, yeah, I, I don't know, but I I hope someone breaks confinement. The problem with confinement, I think, with Ingrimon, no, uh, it's quick aside still is I think there are way too many engineered explosives to rely on that as a lock piece. You will just get yourself killed more often than not. If that's your plan. Yeah, or like. Nowadays, a lot of decks have Prismatic Ending or Force of Vigors in every sideboard. Uh, so, you know, Enchantress hasn't really delivered on that initial oh. hype. Um, but that was that was actually, going back to the Ravnica PC, during the next kind of year of development in that format, that was when people really learned how to break life in the loam. And like these aggro loam decks, and then yep. uh, Cal with Solitary Confinement and Life in the Loam was like this lock engine. I, uh, I will go on record that I think cutting Confinement from the main deck of that deck actually made it better, but that's a different I, I would, Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Anyway, uh, old men reliving you know, their glory days, whatever. Let's, uh, or not back, so glorious days. Yes. Uh, so 
Lost the canister round seven, but uh, pretty sure I'm locked for top eight anyway. So, so kind of uh, nice to, to have the loss to give. This person is a notoriously well good performer at the pro pro yeah. level, even so, though a lot of people don't know this. I think. Yes. Yeah. Kind of this is Nico Boney, who yeah. um, you you will remember, of course, back in yeah. the day, these fierce debates between uh, like. Who's going to do better at the Legacy GP? Is it going to be the Legacy Specialist or is it going to be random pros who never play Legacy and are just picking up the deck the night before, right? right. And it turns out that uh, when it comes to Vintage, uh, Nico or Shir Khan is both the hardcore pro who is better than you naturally and also the Vintage Specialist who knows more about the format than you do. So exactly, yeah. <laughs> a, a fearsome uh, foe to, to go up against, not once but twice in this tournament here. And... The funny thing about this storyline is this is uh, round eight, uh, six and one bracket. Nico started 0-1 in this event, lost the first round, and uh -huh. just rattled off uh, eight wins in a row after this point, yep. <laughs> I believe. And, and I was uh, two of those, sadly. So uh, we'll, we'll get through the first one of those here. I know that uh, they are on PO this time. They've been doing this uh, 30 decks in 30 yeah, rounds I, thing, where they, they keep too. mixing it up. Yep. And the virtue of that is they publish their deck list for the day on Twitter, so I was able to just uh, go and take a look. And hey, this hand seems pretty nice, so let, let's keep it. Let's see what happens. Oh, he has uh, he has some good taste. <laughs> yeah, I guess when so, you've top eighted multiple PTs and you're old, right? And you, you here I am with these, frankly, disgusting uh, moxes and soul rings and so on. And it's I'm actually kind of molding that like you were on the play well 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 that of course but also that you you could win an eternal weekend and get like a giant painting of this new art which is only new because they wanted it for magic online and which no one yeah. has any sentimental attachment to it's like okay i'm just gonna flip that to a dealer for 10 grand or whatever rather than you know anyway um so so you actually have a bunch of options here but i think the one that makes the most sense is to just play soul ring then play time walk leaving up yeah. cluster right yeah think how different this game is if i'm on the play and i get to like time yeah. walk into a play saga under my hand time twister right but uh not to be unfortunately so and do so you now mystical i could for mystical tinker? yeah i you, do mystical for tinker yeah i mean when they have a start like that the best thing to do is to just see if they lose to your thing i think because i i don't really feel casting a time twister is very appealing notably um not playing Saga first because with Citadel you want to have like a land yeah, drop to exactly. give yep. if you hit a clump of those. And it's not I'm not gonna find a better spot to cast a Tinker because right now there's no Flusterstorm access for my opponent. Or Pyroblast so or yeah. whatever. So they they're gonna need two pitches or two pieces of pitch counter magic basically to to get their way out of this. Um so they spin the top, there's the first one, and there's a the second one. So we faded off a bunch of cards, but hey, I have a Saga and a Time Twister, so actually not feeling that bad about this still. Um, hoping they don't turn up anything too fearsome with that top. And so now I have a, a choice, actually, because yep. I could just Twister, right? Which, obviously, in a pseudo-mirror, has a lot of risk associated with it. Or I could pass a turn, get some value out of this Saga, um, and then, like get Lotus, set myself up to Twister, potentially with a bunch of mana floating, and it seems like that might work out better for me. That does give my opponent the chance to, you know, they they look at the top three, they crack their fetch, they look again, they get... So they're looking at, effectively, a new hand of seven cards, right? Um, the math is a little mm. fudge in there, right? Because they're reshuffling, but um, yeah. they're, they're essentially getting to dig through time, so to speak. And if they hit something good, like their own Tinker, then... It's a well, problem. Th this qualifies as good, I think. Th this is a problem, yeah. So they and again, this is the advantage to having the PO stuff uh, in your deck. So, and so now I, yeah, <laughs> no, I fucking days that, I'm doing Jarvis. <laughs> no, well, now you're priced into casting time twister, I think. Once again, we'll note if this was a Lavinia, for example. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> it is so funny how. Like every single time I draw this card, the specific card I would have replaced it with would have been astronomically better. Like just unbelievably so much, uh, <laughs> so much superior. Can we call it scams undoing? Yes. So, Ooh. Look, look, yeah. Like look okay. at this. I even get to bait something yeah, with the ancestral. Nice. This, this is awesome. It's the misstep. So now I'm thinking, all right, did I just steal this one? Uh, they have forced 
and they have another one. But and they are at that... seven, and I mean, it depends on what they have. Well, here, I think. they have DT, so that's not good. <laughs> and this and... is where recall comes into play. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Ooh, so I actually, I draw the Citadel, and it's like, well, okay, I have, if I draw Mox Jet, then I have this to go with it, or, uh, you know, so there are ways where I could end up casting this conceivably, although it's, you know, my Lotus is gone, so that sucks. Um, but they, they hit again off this, and yeah. I'm kind of surprised you scooped that Citadel, because they're only at six. Uh, yeah, I mean... I, I don't really have good draws left in my deck at that point is the problem. Like, I don't have my own PO stuff to work towards. And, sure. you know, they're drawing at least five cards for free. They get to respin again. Like, I, I, I was I was just off it. Okay. No. You're allowed to be off it. So I mulligan, uh, and then... So, question for you. Do you really like Oracles in these, like, semi-big blue mirrors? It, it might just be recency bias after what happened to me in that first game. But I think it is kind of necessary for clearing up saga tokens and like other stuff that might come along with that and so i think just having one copy of that effect in the deck does go a long way obviously it's a better card to have in po well often it's a ritual or with top it's you know it's drawing a card in the process well i guess the other question is uh well, let's take a look real quick how what did you actually take out okay so echoing truth because it's ends. I yeah, Dole, days I'm doing. Right. I left in the Twister because I I need to have enough nut draws on my own. And then also I know from seeing the list, I don't have to worry about a bunch of like hole breaches for the Twister or there aren't a bunch of Lavinias that me, would mean I want to leave uh sure. swords in. Um wait, so did uh Nico play red for Pyro? No, this was just Esper. Oh, it's just Esper. Yeah. But yeah, look, I, I'm really under the gun here, and now I'm regretting having bottomed that Hercules recall uh, sure. in my six card hand. The time to vamp for. I can vamp for it again, right? Or you could vamp uh, for kind of time twister and see if that's good enough. That that's what I strongly was thinking about because I'm also going to have a fetch oh. with the saga to get you know Lotus soaring. Something well, in that vein, so if I want the it. The actual problem is, aren't you getting attacked for 12 damage? I am. So I'm so, going to have to put in the other hole breacher if I want to kick one around. What um, happened? I think this just broke the replay. But anyway, what happened was I put in hole breacher, blocked one of these, took a bunch of damage. Uh, I vamped for Hercules on my upkeep, and then uh, they were able to just, uh, they flustered that, and then Force wouldn't do anything. Um, but it was a three game match, right? No, I I get uh, oh, this one did I just yeah. skip ahead or something? You skipped ahead, I think. Oh, so wait, we were in no, we watched we, we watched game one of the first match, but we didn't watch oh. game two of the <laughs> okay, okay, well. that's, that's <laughs> yeah, I I was confused. I'm like, wait, this is a three game match. Okay, this All hand right. seems much better than the one you showed us previously. You, you can understand how uh, yeah, this, of course. this one went to three games. The problem is, uh, when you play the exact same opponent, it's easy to conflate the matches, right? right? It's like, you don't know which one's which, and like, wait, what happened in which one? It's a few minutes literally back-to-back, -back, right? Yeah. All right, well, okay, well, you're fine him to Shara King them for two points, I guess. Yeah, uh, Mario, there was... Some reason I don't remember why that was off the table because I spent a long time thinking about what to vamp for, but um, yeah, this is another spot where I wasn't sure like, do I jam it main phase? Do I do it on their turn? Um, ended up doing it at the end of their turn. Draw the Narset. Uh, Set for Construct Town. It is. So I, I don't want, I, you know, I'm kind of scared of them just doing something nutty this turn, but yeah, yeah. as it turns out, they have a pretty slow hand. They can't always have it, right? Yeah, and it's played Wait, Narset. They just, they just concede to Narset? Oh, their hand yeah, must be I'm, really bad if that's the case. Well, if it's a bunch of, like, flusses and POs or something, then... Oh, sure. Right? That, that's, one of the thing, that's one of the issues I have with Paradoxical Outcome is 
the the problem with i think with the deck is you need to get a few artifacts into play but what's the best way to do that is to play card drawers to get there like and they can't just be like preordains you kind of yeah. need something that you basically need uh draw to essentially right yeah it, it doesn't it's... really work it's really awkward that there's not a good way to play like astrolabe or something, right? And the I think there people are have tried, and it's they generally have. was not very good. There, there are also diminishing returns on how many tops you can play. Yep. Like the second one is so much worse than the first one, and so you know that is maybe the natural angle to lean on, but it just doesn't really work the way you want it to. Well, yeah, I think really realistically, if if Thoughtcast or something was good like that, then you would play it. But I think. If you want to play with Urza Saga, that also is a concession to the fact that it's hard to put Knight's Whisper or Thoughtcast into your deck. Yeah, mistaken. exactly. It it all sort of cascades. It's kind of weird because you see the opposite be true in Modern, where everyone's like, oh, we get to play with Urza Saga, time to put four Thought Monitors in our deck. Then you could just play Thoughtcast in that deck if you wanted to, except no one does, because how many Thoughtcasts do you actually need? It's kind of weird right. that the reverse is true, right? Yeah, so Saga into Mana Vault is an uh, <laughs> interesting that's... opening. And my hand is pretty slow here, but I figure, given enough time, it can maybe get up to good stuff. But this is why Saga, I think, is so good in these blue mirrors, right? Is yep. almost immediately I'm feeling yeah, I, some I, kind of pressure. I'm also not never forcing that uh, Mana Vault first. Right. There's some case of like, do you preordain? Do you hold up brainstorm? I think you preordain. Uh, um, I would preordain as well because like I don't want to brainstorm this turn anyway. Or is this turn? Yeah. Uh, but, well, but this is so I'm like, well, yep. I have to force, and they just force uh, back. And, oh, and they, they already have the key. key, so I just die uh, on turn two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, good beats. You got vintage, so, real good. Compelling gameplay. Yeah. Both both sides played hard. Uh, some so people. some people would argue that you could die. Your opponent could die to the manifold. The problem is that we'll get to four mana to untap it before that ever happens. Well, they also have sagas in play, so that's oh yeah, like so they just can't like <laughs> yeah yeah never mind yeah. All right, well, like, I think it's actually it's actually kind of impossible for the deck to have a series of draws where they die over twenty turns of the mana vault. <laughs> like I'm not sure it's actually. All right, uh, possible. so this is the rematch in top eight because our hero has made top eight at six. How many people were in this event? Like one one thirty five. Oh, then yeah, you started five o or uh six o. So I, I was lost. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're relatively safe. Uh, well, I don't know. You're in the draw. Hands kind of awkward, actually. It's like, you know, you know what's really a good magic card? Days undoing. Yeah. So this is a. Uh... It's like, well, okay, I have to win in the next two turns with my glacially slow. <laughs> uh, well, you have Gitaxian probe, which helps a lot. Uh, what did it, what did probe see? Does it help? Uh, well, apparently it's not. Possible Hercules recall, so it can't oh, be those. Oh, this is really bad. You're probably so what dead. I have to do, I have to mystical for Tinker and then oh, just do, blind draw yep. Lotus off my. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, you could draw Mana Crypt. Well, but then how am I getting the blue sauce? Okay, so Modo just decided to disappear, but that was the end of game one, and we just watched game two out of sequence anyway. So, you know, we kind of got everything we need to see uh, out of that. Wait, why does Modo keep crashing? Replay feature is very, very, very buggy now, apparently. Yeah, it's uh, it's a mess. Um, yeah, that that's the, the tournament, basically. All right, well... That is a uh, vintage, well, not all vintage, but that is um, what you played. Let's yeah. See if we can go back, to my moto because you know what time it is. Chess time. Yeah. Let me go back. How do I? So I, I guess we should like debrief the deck quickly. Yes. I guess. Um. So first change is cut the days undoing. Uh, I think I would probably cut the fourth hole breach as well now. Um. You know, leading us into that angle, add the two Lavinias at the very least, maybe change the Echoing Truth for the the Hercules or something in the main deck. Um, could fiddle around with the land count too. Beyond that, I mostly like where the main deck is at. Um, kind of want, like, one of the big card draw spells, maybe a Dig Through Time, specifically. And then the sideboard needs some reworking, because if Dredge is going to be the go-to Bizarre deck, then I need a much better plan to handle that. Um... Don't know what that would look like exactly. Maybe Leyline, but I don't even know how I don't, I, great that well, is. 
my go-to from these decks for a stretch is actually Tenzin's Ixwood Jailer. Yeah. Because I think the way the cards line up is the only way they can generally answer it. In, in most of the versions I've seen is Force of Will. That's like easy enough to handle. And you have a lot of Moxin in your deck, so you have a reasonable chance of turn one it. The other thing. I actually don't love Yixwood Jailer in decks that don't have enough fast mana. Because I think if you just cast Jailer and do, you're often just already dead. Personally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that's my theory on that. I would probably play Jailer. And, uh, yeah, would you cut the whole Breacher with a Narset? I don't know. I I kind of like the Narset, I think, if it's going to be opposing blue decks. Um, I, it's weird. Like, it's, whole Breacher is so much better against Bug, for example, but, you know, neither is that great against Bug. Sure. Um, whole Breacher at least can threaten to trade with a Leovold or something. Um... I don't know. I, but just slimming down on that effect slightly, I think, makes sense. It's weird to say that after a weekend where PO just completely dominated. Um, right. So maybe you just stick with as much of that as possible. Maybe the main deck Needle isn't good. Uh, it's I, tough I, to say, because like, uh, realistically, you never get two Saga for that against Dredge. And so, you know, maybe you can vamp or DT for it in some hands, but I, you, or you just like draw it and book some free wins that way. But I don't know. I think Jailer tends to be better than Containment Priest for a few reasons. Um, yeah, Priest is actually not even good against the non-Dredge Bizarre decks for the most part. Right, that's actually true, because they can still cast Hogak from the graveyard because of how uh, Containment Priest is worded. That's like a big reason to play Jailer over Priest, in my opinion. Jailer does let them cast Hogak from their hand, which is still an issue. Yeah, sure, um, but so does Containment Priest, so that's like kind of whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Lavinia is is a really nice one against bizarre decks of any stripe. Um, so yeah. just yet, yet another argument in favor of that card. But I wonder if, you know, the next step in the format is moving back to Pyroblast in some capacity. Uh, maybe not Breach, but I, like, I, I don't know what the Pyroblast deck would be exactly. Um, there have been Grixis uh, whole Breach decks before, right? Where you have Wheel of Fortune over Days Undoing and you can start some Pyroblast in there. So... Maybe that's an angle to take. I don't know. I'm addressing some questions. I don't actually understand the question that's being asked, I guess. Because the uh, Contaminant Breeze says if it's not cast. Also, Hollow One doesn't come from the graveyard anyways? Question mark? Yeah, so... Lovenia stops Hollow One. That's the one you want there. Yeah, again. but the person said Priest, right? Yes, yeah. That's the question. Uh... But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think Contentment Priest has aged very well in this format. The real reason to play Contentment Priest is, I think, if people are playing Oath of Druids again, but didn't look like Oath did particularly well. Honestly, the only person that wins Oath with Oath is that, uh, what's her name, Maharu? Uh, Furumiya, Fu yeah. Yeah, Who I've lost is... them quite a few times. She's qualified, and so you know yes. you'll be playing against <laughs> Oath. Uh... Maybe. If you get paired with them, you'll play against Oath. What's interesting is I think their go-to Oath hit right now is Arcanal Cruelty. Yep. Which yep. I don't really understand in general, but specifically here, it is like so much less scary than every other conceivable I I, Oath target. I don't understand the logic behind that either. I guess it's easier to hardcast, but like then... Like, is it? <laughs> I mean... I, I don't no, know. No. I mean, it's just really peculiar that you would i mean grizzlebrand's not good for small breacher dot deck either but i mean i don't want a grizzlebrand but i'm sure there's i don't believe those are your only options i don't i don't know maybe i i, I can't think of it uh, the i guess the issue is grizzlebrand's not good for small breacher but well emrakul has aged really badly i think it just you have to play like dragon's breath to make it good, and that's, like, another dead card you put in your deck. Like, Oath has the problem that if you made sure some cards were in the correct zones, I think it would almost always be best to do Emrakul, but it's, uh... That's not how magic works. Sometimes you draw a Dragon's Breath, right? Yeah, I mean, having said that, I don't know what the best alternative would be, necessarily. Like, like Sun Titan hasn't aged that well either, I think. Yeah. Um... So yeah, maybe Archon actually is like I, I trust Maharu to have uh, 
done the Skyfall search or whatever here. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that, that's one of many fearsome opponents I have waiting for me in the uh, the Vintage yeah. Showcase. So, I mean, not to spoil your preparation, but I think generally speaking, preparing for these tournaments is a lot different from preparing from open field tournaments. Yes. Because I think yeah. people's proclivities matter hell of a lot more. And if, it, if the format lines up such that one deck exploits all of your opponents, you definitely should play that deck, even if you hate it. Uh, you Maybe. should just learn it and play the hell out of it. Maybe even, you know, learn to love it, I would say. Mm. Oh, we'll no, see. no, 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 learn to love. But... Uh, well, I, I, as an example of that, right? So I said, coming into this tournament, I take out my deck against non-Dredge Bazaar, end up losing to Dredge, two copies of Dredge in the top eight. And now, because of that, those two players are both in the showcase, which is not a hundred and something player event. It's a 24 player event. So if you know there are guaranteed to be at least two dredge decks, you have to prepare for that because yeah. that's, what is it, already 8%. like a decent percentage of the field? So. It's a little bit over 8%. It's like yeah. actually 8.33% and... or something. And it only takes one or two more dredge pilots for that to be like a sizable portion of the event. And, you know, Canister is going to be one of the best players in the event. So likely going to have to go through him at some point to win the tournament so yeah i i don't honestly don't know what i'm going to do for that event yet it's going to be well, a so, interesting process uh, to address bond 22 i think there for these events the best deck is very usually not actually the best deck in the format to be quite Correct. fair which is kind of a weird counterpoint to a lot of events where you usually just do the best playing so-called best deck i think here what actually happens is because of the rock, paper, scissors nature of magic sometimes that there's a way to generally get an edge in deck selection for specifically a small field. For a Grand Prix, I would never advise this because I think you're just like giving up too much on power level, generally speaking. Yeah, I, I think it does vary heavily by format as well, where right. in some formats you have a best deck that is mostly unexploitable and... I've run into issues in the past of trying to exploit that deck and end up ending up getting oh, like I, next leveled by other people trying to do the same thing, so, or my matchup is yeah, not yeah. actually as good as I believe it was. Um, and so, like the Urza decks in Modern were a good example there, or like Delva in Legacy as well. Hogak, um, Hogak, anyone? Modern Hogak? Yeah, well, that's so it, interestingly for the the PC in 2019. You know, you you have this dynamic for all three formats, right? Standard, Modern, and uh, yeah. and Legacy. And in Legacy, you know, one team, there were like four out of 16 Hogak decks because they expected everyone else will show up with Fair Blue, which is mostly what happened, and they would get to play on that. Um, for Vintage, I, I think it's an interesting dynamic because you have uh, both Bazaar and Shops as decks which, like, how much people prepare for those and respect those drastically changes their matchup profiles right. across the field. And if you expect people to play one of bizarre or shops or fair blue in high quantities you really can gun hard for those if you want to um so that idea of unexploitability just doesn't really come up but there are so many heavily polarized decks that like how do you actually reach a equilibrium in that in that field right uh, i think the notion of equal equilibrium or, is, yeah. is kind of overrated because that assumes you can get a correct distribution of decks people play which is, Although that's what you want to do, which in a top-heavy yeah. field, yeah. Well, I think it's generally... I don't think you want an equilibrium. I think you want to, you know, pinpoint for... How do I put it? I think you want to figure out what people are not going to play and just cut all of your cards for those decks and figure out what people are going to play and put in more cards for that, which sounds simple. Then you realize, like, there's 32 people to do this. 31. 31. Barring LCQs, because, you know, a few people could sneak in, or if there was overlap. So it's between, like, you know, 28 to 33 players. And you have to figure out what every one of them is going to do and how to, like, correctly weigh it. And, you know, honestly, it takes time to even play those matchups, like, versus each individual deck that you expect to play against and come up with a coherent plan. That's a lot of work. Yeah, and looking back at uh, previous Vintage Showcase Finals, you had the one that Justin won against uh, Reed Duke, right? Where <laughs> Reed was oh, on yeah. like a very taked out build of shops, or you had uh, F Newt, uh, Pete Wall just like picking up DPS of all things I, for that event. And... I would call that shop stack Jun Shops. 
because what he did was was he just put in all efficient creatures and cut like and some of the bad cards from the deck honestly honestly i looked at it and i'm like this is just john jobs yeah, although cut some of the cards that were good against PO and stuff. If I although, it, it, yeah. as I recall, Justin also cut a lot of the anti shops cards. So that that's the kind of dynamic that you get in these uh, in these events. Yeah, it's interesting. And legacy, I don't know. It's weird. The last two legacy showcases were literally won by elves, but I kind of think that's not going to happen again. I mean, obviously it could, but I think the format shifted into a way that elves is probably not the best choice for that. Oh. Format. Uh, so Justin's also saying that uh, Combo Shops won one of these well, showcases, it, but it, no, I, I don't think I've ever heard anything no, about that. It's, it's no, the, no. Oh, wait, are we just erasing Slasher? <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. It was more of a meme than the fact that you didn't actually forget. You, you know what else is more of a meme? Combo Shops. Yeah. Anyway, I, you, you were saying. I tried that deck so many times, and I'm like, I cannot win it with this deck. What is wrong <laughs> with me? Uh, then it turns out almost no one... Could win with that deck except for slasher so i don't i don't really understand i guess yama won a little bit with it but mostly my experience playing that deck was i would mulligan in hands i'm like all right cool i have thespian stage and claim on the void what is my deck doing or, or uh you could have what happened to me against a bizarre deck where i kept a good hand drew three ley lines in a row and then died without casting any spells oh so. did you consider playing more herb orgs in your deck <laughs> see that that was uh the next level that i didn't get to but Honestly, uh, I'll just say this for general knowledge. I kind of think one of the huge winners from Urza Saga was actually Goa Shops. It's one yes. of the decks that does it the best. And it also finally got to cut all the stupid combo cards because now you don't need to do that shit because you just beat them down with 88 constructs instead. It's just a much more coherent, cohesive plan that actually works every single game. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's one of the decks that when Justin publishes the data every week, it seems like it's always... Oh, best win percentage, Golo Shops, Golo Shops. And then I try it myself and I can just never perform with it. But maybe I, I, I'll I have to think, go through the ringer well, again here. I actually honestly think that this deck is good, but you also have to have a very specific mindset to play it. It's not just like, this is very different from the other decks in Vintage, I think. Where like, yes. you have to like, I think actually most of your hands that have a lot of win cuts, you sh should actually mulligan. You're actually just like, you need the correct mix of cards, is how I would put it. Ideally, like one sphere, one win con, maybe two spheres, and probably a waste. And like Golos is just a way to like ensure you get all those in a timely fashion, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, but like honestly, the reason I think Saga was the biggest pickup for this deck was like now you really should play four Crucibles. Crucible is your best card by so much, it's kind of nuts. Like, to be quite fair. Yeah, and now it's recurring like a good threat, you know, every, every uh, other turn as well. So yeah, that's uh, that's nice. I, I'll I'll have to try this again along with everything else because I have cursed myself and jinxed myself <laughs> by qualifying for well, this also, damn tournament. You, you said you had to find good internet while on vacation, which is honestly not trivial. Like to be quite fair. Yeah, gonna be on hard mode there, but uh, gonna gonna make it work well, if I can. It, I guess it depends on where you're going. There's always cell phone hotspot, right? I guess so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know where you're going. Maybe you're going to somewhere where there's no cell phones, but then, or no cell phone coverage. Then I'm like, well, if you're going to somewhere that has no good cell phone coverage, what's the likelihood there's actually good internet there? I mean, it's not like I'm going on some camping holiday in the deepest wilderness. As anyone who knows me will attest, I am not equipped mentally or physically for a camping holiday. Oh, but, I, I, uh... <laughs> camping is horrible in my opinion. Oh, no offense to people who love camping. I loathe it so much. Like, why would you do that to yourself? Yeah, I uh, I will at least be near civilization, as far as I can tell. So I uh, okay. should be I able mean, to solve that problem. What land does the ghost get? You get Caracas, and you bounce your ghost, and you get an Inventor's Fair. Inventor's Fair gets Crucible, and you keep replaying the Inventor's Fair. And it actually spirals out and gets the rest of your deck. Obviously, this is a very slow process, and bad things could happen. But uh, technically, Golos can just get the rest of your deck. Yeah, I think it, Golos is just kind of like the best threat nowadays against pretty much everyone. Uh, it, it's also like being able to tutor up Tabernacle or one of your wastes is super important in a lot of matchups I've I found. And like, obviously, if you're just playing against someone who's trying to kill you back, you can go get Urza Saga and just make a bunch of blockers. Mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, I'm still I'm getting bad flashbacks from that standard open where I was forced to play literally like 14 <laughs> rounds of Golos Mirrors because like, I mean, first off, it was correct for me to do that even though my record was like actually like 50 percent. Then they banned it before the PT. I'm like, thank God. Instead, we had to play only Oko Mirrors, but my win rate in Oko Mirrors was much higher because that's like more like aggressive positioning. What happens in like a Golos standard mirror was someone would get field advantage and then win. That's literally what happened every time. Yeah, that was uh that was an unpleasant tournament for so many reasons. But <laughs> every 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 round went to time. Every round went to time, and also this was you know in the thick of the points race that year. Where like my team didn't day two despite you know having a great team, and then the next day my teammate won a classic. Everyone else either like top eight of the open or won something else, and I was just like, all right, zero point weekend again or two point weekend. I'm in the Valley Forge Casino Resort, so, you know, literal hellscape. And, yeah, it was, it was a frankly just oh, miserable experience. And can we talk about how I asked the head judge if they could make a proxy for Kenrith, and the response was, no, you can get non-foil ones. And I, my response was, do you think you could actually get a non-foil one in this room? It's like, okay, I will give you a $100 bill. You can go well, and buy I, me a non-foil Kenrith, and you can keep the change. All right? How, how does that sound? <laughs> and the answer was none of the dealers actually had non-foil Kenriths. So, like, that was actually just a lie from them. I, yeah, like, I mean, that actually made me irate. Not because, like, the person probably thought they were technically correct, but I knew for a fact that they were actually incorrect. Yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, it, it's very frustrating. It, it and drove me nuts because the person just like treated me like an idiot. I'm like, dude, I did my homework. It was actually impossible to get this card. I have three foil candidates. I just refuse to play with them because they look like they're heavily marked. Yeah, it, it, yeah. The whole situation was a mess, but anyway, <laughs> uh, did didn't pass now, thankfully. Well, Nexus of Fate. Oh no, Nexus of Fate was before that. I I really hope they never do that shit again. But uh. It said we'll just get uh, etched oils that and like sketch arts and like I don't know. There's too many printings of things. I'm going insane. Jarvis, less yelling at clouds, more opening chests. Fuck. All right. Also, if you want more chess opens, you can uh, hit that sub button, hit that follow button, and uh, you know we have four chests on the stack. But Dom, you're gonna have to tell us some old man stories about each card. Right. Ooh, sick bar. Okay. So this is uh, from Cold Snap, which <laughs> has a place in my heart because uh, when I was a wee lad, a, a, a young man, um, this was one of the more recent sets. And after... So where I would play, it wasn't an LGS, strictly speaking. It was a toy store. And we would play on the top of like these overturned uh, like Hot Wheels boxes or whatever else just in the middle of the store with all of these very confused middle-class parents with their young brats just, you know, going back and forth in between. Um, and after that, every weekend, we would go to a local pub and I was not able to drink because I was 14 years old and we would do just three-man cold snap drafts every weekend. And well, well, uh, Hold on. You were 14 when cold snap came out? Yes. 13 uh, even. God. What? Are you really eight years younger than I am? How old are you now? 29? 28, Jarvis. A youthful 28. All right, but you're about to be an old man 29 soon. Uh, I, I, I've got a few months left of being 28. I don't know. Right. Don't I just wanted to sure. check because I remember when the set came out and I looked at Counter Melons. I'm like, that's going to be unpleasant to play against because Top was oh, yeah. standard. And spoiler, it was not pleasant to play against. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, Cold Snap turned one of the all time great standard formats into just like an absolute shit show for like two months. <laughs> so. Uh, let me tell you what I believe the best decks were in that format after Cold Snap came out. I believe Boo Black Counterbalance Dark Confidant was a good deck, and Boo White Red Technically Enduring Ideal with Counterbalance was also a very good deck. No other decks were playable. Yeah. Opinion. Back in the day when Paolo did one of his uh, top five oh, articles, yeah. and yep. this was some time ago, so maybe the answer yep. has changed since then, but uh, for top five best decks he's ever played, number one was this... Uh, this enduring ideal deck with like yep. counterbalance top and uh scrying sheets cold steel heart and the idea was because ideal was so expensive you couldn't counterbalance it right so in the mirrors you would eventually just get there and, and win with that and also you yeah. had this top scrying sheets engine so you would just outdraw them at the same time and then against aggro you had just like 
Kohusar, Faith Feathers, Wrath of God, you know, mm. all of the usual anti aggro tools. And so even though the deck looked just very strange conceptually, it was actually, you know, with the exception of like the Cryoclasm Stone Rain Remon decks, which were a thing in themselves. Um, other than that, you basically just crush everyone. Well, so specifically for the semi mirrors as well, you decided in a bunch of both Sages and no one could ever beat you. So like that, well, that's that also too. what yeah. happened. All right. We got we got three more chests on the stack. Remember, subs equal more chests. Oh. This is one of my favorite cards because of the name and because of the art. And it's actually, I believe, close to being a card name in a whole bunch of other games as well. Yeah, this is one of the go-tos if uh, you have to name a card for an effect when you're BMing your opponent. So Meddling Mage, <laughs> Cabal Therapy, uh, really anything in that vein. Like This is uh, one of the all-timers there. I believe the other card, let me look it up real quick, is Savage Beatdown from Versus. Ah, yes. Let's see what... It, I never played this game. I just know this card exists. Look, it's the Hulk getting uh, his beatdown on. How could it be bad? Looks sweet, right? Plus five attack? That's so much, Jarvis. I don't, I don't know if that's permanent or not. I suspect how that game worked, it would actually be permanent. But whatevs. A Savage Beatdown's a nice one. Oh, it's an OG Chase Fair. All right, cool. Tell me about Phyrexian Crusader. Uh, well, it's now finally a Phyrexian, which... Uh, yeah, you know, surely you... that is what <laughs> all of those creatures needed to have another creature type. You, you can uh, you can quibble with that on, like, Glisten Elf or whatever, but it makes sense for the literal Phyrexian Crusader, I, I feel. I agree. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, po has popped up across the years in, like, black green infect decks where there's a bunch of lightning bolts and paths floating around and this dodges all of the commonly played removal so you would see that but back in the day um i remember the block pc where a bunch of people were like lash riding up for x and crusader and needle specter and so on and like that was actually one of the best decks somehow Play that block pt would you like to guess my deck uh were you a, a tempered seal gamer Oh, I would have done much better in that tournament if I had been. <laughs> G guess again. We own some like slow control deck with oh, a bunch wow. of shadows. Oh wow, you understand me it, so well. Jarvis, we own a slow control deck with a bunch of shadows that still somehow did not actually beat the Tempest no, Seal. No, 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 no. Even worse than that, I was on a slow control deck that had no shadows, and had Blacks on Zenith, and a bunch of Ball Springs and Desert Asian Bullets. Oh dear God! Right, so my favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> story from that tournament was uh Suzuki Fujita, like longtime Japanese yeah. beloved Hall of Famer and so on, just like comes out of, to of retirement to top eight that PC with like it was like either a red green deck splashing Tezzeret or the reverse, like uh -huh. a blue green deck splashing a bunch of red and green cards just off uh both wellsprings. And it was like the most solidly unplayable deck I've ever seen, but if somehow just you, you know you're a Hall of Famer, that's why, right? Well, it, you have to remember. Uh, let's see. Three. Let's see, uh, how many? How many rounds are in each of the days? Seven, eight, eight. Oh yeah. Uh, remember, thirty-seven point five percent of your PT matches are limited. That's the actual answer. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The the best poster child for that was Hayden's Miracles deck from Poker Absinthe. Yeah, there are so many decks which get remembered as the deck of their PT, when actually they didn't do that one in Constructed, but everyone who played them just did one in Limited. Um, and that's that's always been one of those things where you're analyzing the data for a tournament yep. for, that has multiple formats, and you have to like tease that out very carefully. Like, it yeah. actually, yeah. with uh, during COVID, all of the, the online tournaments where it's like standard and historic, and it's so often it's like, oh, this team broke it with their standard deck, but actually... Their standard deck was pretty medium, and they just crushed Historic, or vice versa. Well, so and it's... it's actually pretty easy to tease that out, because MDG Melee lets you go look at what right, their actual right. records were. And so, honestly, if you did the work for any of those tournaments, it's easy to tell. And re related to that, for my money, the best deck of Pro Tour Avacyn Restored was either the British uh, Jun deck that had Severed the Bloodline to kill Wolf or Soul Hearts in the Mirror, or Bant Hexproof that Sam came up with the last minute after... He basically did one of those things was like, yeah, I know abundant growth works unless you cast things. So why mm. don't we just play a hexproof strategy? Because 
everyone's trying to like gun with targeted removal, but there's very few sweepers. And honestly, Finkel getting queued into Hain, who had four terminus and Devastation Tide, was probably not what he wanted in that tournament. Yeah, the the, the stroke of genius there was realizing that Cavern of Souls was actually the best dual land. And because <laughs> in that deck, it, it yeah. casts Guides of Saint Draft and Strength Group guys. And like, you know, some of your hey, other stuff too. Hey, that's a Sandstep Citadel to you, buddy. I don't know why you are only shortchanging. Uh, I think you'll find it's a Seaside Citadel to you, Jarvis. Anyway. Fuck! Uh, <laughs> ah, how did I fail? <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, but anyways. yeah, there was also the, uh, like, the four-color human reanimator deck. Like, Oh, I, that I was think... Shuda. That was a Shuda invention. And I think literally he was the only one who did it. And he did well. And just like... What the hell is going on here? Well, but also this is genius because the deck field was all mid range decks. Th th so that that's the thing. I think he went nine and one in constructed at that tournament, but this was in the era where Sh Shoda was known for like not being good at limited, and now he fixed that and he's just good at everything. But back in the day, that was like the one weak spot there. Uh, so yeah, nine one in constructed didn't top eight. You know, lot lots of uh, <laughs> stories like that across the years were like. Oh, someone went 10 and constructed. Surely they must have tolerated the PC and won even more. Ma oh, oh, wait, no. Oh, dear. So uh, the, there's actually sort of, a, sort of a confirmation effect because what happens is you don't do well in either of your pods, so you're in kind of a lower bracket to begin with, where you are maybe more likely to play against less skilled players, so then your constructed uh, record gets slightly boosted for that reason. Yeah, you get so on day two, you get to run the table at like yep. X4 as opposed to X1 or X2. Yep. Um, but yeah, the, the John deck from that tournament was weird because like people had it and just didn't play it. And then Kibler plays it at uh, the GP and like does really well with it. And then suddenly that is the one deck basically in this format. And people are like, wow, Kibler's a genius. But like everyone had the deck, they just didn't for some reason pull the trigger on it before then. Our team played Naya, and I think the Moto people finally figured out that you should just play four color John splashing with the colors. I don't remember which ones. It was probably white, but it's hard to remember. It's been literally so long. I, re yeah. I remember just most of the, the block mocks that came after that on MTGO was literally just all like three to four color John on top. I think. I think probably Brad Nelson was in that top eight, if I recall correctly. This was back when he just literally lived on MTGO um, and was like, he was always doing well in those big tournaments. So that was, that was a while ago. Anyways, yeah, that's that, a... that was, so final fun backstory for that tournament. Uh, before he was, uh, you know, household name, world champion, MPL member, BBD actually got intangible virtue and lingering souls banned yep. in that block constructed yep. format by just this winning every single tournament on moto with those cards and th this was when like i don't think he was really a known moto grinder or no. just a known grinder in real life but he was just like bbd right three letter name on moto no no um, if you played I, I remember playing a bunch of block dailies as well and whenever you ran in bbd you knew the lingering souls and virtue were coming for you and it's funny they banned it but then literally bonfire and terminus were burned in the next night it's like <laughs> What the actual fuck? Like, this doesn't actually make any sense, right? Like, I'm kind of irate that that happened because I think that's just an example of a really bad ban. Because, like, yes, there's a chance that you get dominated, but how, why don't you just let the people try, let the people try to fix it on their own? Yes. Anyway, enough more stories for now. Hopefully, one of us can do well in tournament again soon. Come back in here for more, hold on, uh, hold more on. of this. Hold on. Yeah? We still have a few. We have one more chest left, and you Ooh. can say something about planar cleansing. Uh, I still think Detention 2 is better in that standard format, but yeah, not, not trying to relitigate that. M moving swiftly on. All right. Last one, folks. Last one. Uh, this card was so, like... I don't know why people love this card. I kind of think this card just didn't do anything. Oh, it, it's the Murfolk Jarvis. Of course people are going to love it. Sharp, I think that may be redundant. I don't think you need an adjective there. I think that's just, There's some you know... really good Murfolk. Do you want me to name some? No. Your name Nemesis and Whole Preacher. Checkmate. Okay, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I remember when uh, people briefly tried to revive, like, Vintage Merfolk, just Cavern of Souls on True Name Nemesis was, like, unbeatable for <laughs> a good number of people. I think it won, like, Eternal Weekend maybe once, and then I'm just like, then people finally built their decks better and then never won again. Yeah. All right. Uh, that being said, let's see who else... Playing Match the Gathering online because well, what's Arena? I don't know what that is. Do you? 
No, I think the the Zoomers are raving about it, but uh, could never be me. Wait, the Zoomers are raving about it. Why? Why? Why are the Zoomers raving about it? Well, I guess they. No, they all, they're all MBG Joe people. Is you know what they can do? They can make actual dollars to go buy like mango Aussies or or whatever. Right, oh. I, I don't, I don't oh, really oh. have anything else. Jarvis, what? Andrag is playing Death and Taxes. Oh, I, I guess we're <laughs> mandated by law to raid him. And he's mandated by law to play Death and Taxes. He, this is why because he, uh... because XJ won his tournament. What did he expect? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It that was that was literally the most predictable item. Anyways, uh, see you all next time. I'll probably Bye, be friend. back on Thursday or whatever. But see you all then. Goodbye.